usual streaming on YouTube, and we also have a link for a Zoom webinar. It, the link can be found by going to our website, going to the select board, and going to select board packets, and there's a link on our agenda there to join. Um, we, again, uh, we have the same rules and regulations for person in attendance as on Zoom. You can certainly raise your hand and make a comment during the meeting. Um, you can ask a question. If we can get to it, we'll try to answer them. Don't guarantee that. Uh, do not use chat. We're not monitoring that. And again, uh, it's preferred if you just raise your hand if you'd like to comment on an agenda item. With that, we will commence into our agenda and start the meeting with any comments from the public on non-agenda items. Does anybody from the public uh, have not? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Lynch, Lindquist raised his hand first. Sorry, Ray, you're a little slow there. We'll get to you. Uh, good evening. My name is Peter Lindquist. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, your, your microphone is off. Now. There we go. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. I live on Chestnut Street. Um, I am here to make a, a, a list of requests or at least reminders to our select board members and our town manager of situations of safety and health that exist in town and uh, have been uh, not terrifically uh, responded to. Um, one, um, I'm just going to go down through the list. Uh, Mr. Falciani, I asked you for a copy of the interim manager's contract. Have yet to see that for the uh, Midcoast Solid Waste. This meeting has nothing to do with. Of course it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. So, so we that, just, just we'll deal with that separately. Oh, please. that's great. Pay okay. To the, uh, on top of that, I'd like to ask while it, while we're here, copies of uh, contracts. I'd like a copy of Audra's contract. Do you think you can provide me with that? I don't believe we would give any any personal information to the public. A contract for employment. I'm, that is signed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's great. I appreciate it. Now on to number two. The safety situation up at the Ragged Mountain Recreation Area. At least three years ago, I brought up and sent emails and photos of the situation of the patrol shack, which has no stairway, and it asks employees and volunteers to walk up a precarious rock and ice covered ledge. Uh, I did get a response from our town manager, and she tried to tell me that it was more of the responsibility of the volunteers, the ski patrol. I disagree with that. I think it is a town facility. We insure it, and we ask employees and uh, volunteers to work there. So I think we've got a very serious situation, and I'd be glad to send those photos to you all again if you'd like. Um, you, Bob, you ask me for evidence. You would say, Peter, show me the evidence. So if, if you need that, I can get that to you. Um, here's another example of evidence of safety. And, and it just health. We have employees in town that work for our town that smoke cigarettes on the job while they're working. I find that, I'm sure it's in their policy manual, it's against the rules. It's, it's happening. We pay for insurance. I think it needs to be addressed. Can't seem to get, you know, help on this. Um, <laughs> I've asked our town manager about our safety and health program, the, the similar one that is done in Ro Rockport. I believe it's called SHAPE. And um, that, no, that, we do a better job on our own. Okay. Uh, safety and health over again at the Ragged Mountain Recreation Area. The town of Camden is a landlord to a small business over there. And they pay thousands of dollars a month to rent a trailer that is, is rotten, has rotten floorboards and moldy and crappy interior. Now again, from a health and sta safety standpoint, a landlord <laughs> shouldn't be asking a paying tenant to put up with unhealthy situations. So it's been brought up before and it's ignored so what do we do? Do we call our health department to come in and inspect a piece of property that we should be taking care of for this tenant who we're trying to support? I, I brought this up at the budget committee meeting, and I brought this up during our a, a, a select board a campaign, and I was summarily ignored. So I, I guess I have to just bring it up at a town meeting like tonight. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I've asked, again, in budget committee meetings and in uh, uh, meetings with department heads, 
What is the strategic plan of the Ragged Mountains Recreation Area? I was told, oh, Peter, we'll get that to you. Never saw anything. I've told, uh, Audra got up uh, a couple of months ago and said uh, that uh, uh, a grant was, had fallen through. Okay, what was this a grant in relation to? And how did it fit with our strategic plan? I just, I don't understand what's changed, what hasn't changed, and what is the plan at this moment. Mm -hmm. And we don't see it publicized. Mm -hmm. We don't issue a newsletter mm -hmm. that the, that the, the uh, residents could read. Um, and then last but not least, again, I, I brought this up three times, and you'll remember this, Bob, um, and, and to our, our code enforcement officer, this town does not have a clear-cutting or ordinance. You're allowed to clear-cut wherever you want in town, many acres as you want. The state of Maine has a clear-cutting ordinance, and I thought we were interested in erosion control and environmental impact and all sorts of stuff. But I brought it up time and time again, and I was told, nope, we're too busy, we got other priorities. And it's really kind of sad because the town of Camden was the, well, there's one, there was the violator of one clear-cutting incident up at the, in front of Hosmer Pond, but there was another one right across the street. And if we had an ordinance, it would have stopped or at least brought up a discussion. Right now, you can still go out and clear-cut, and I sent you an article, or it was a piece of property for sale. It was 87 some odd acres. Mm -hmm. Somebody could have bought that in Camden and clear cut it. That's, you know, it's, it, it, I have to bring this up because I, I, don't, I don't get a lot of phone calls or emails. I don't know why. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Yep. Good to see you. you. And now, Ray. Just one page this time. Okay. Uh, Ray Andreessen, Camden resident. Um, I'm a member of the Save the Montgomery Dam Committee, and we had 500 voters of the town of Camden who signed our petition to place our warrant article before the town for approval. We are obligated to those 500 people who signed our petition and to other citizens who want to save the dam. And that is why we are holding a special town meeting on September 27th to present our warrant article to the town. We seek the town to help in this regard, including having the registrar of voters there, the free use of the opera house on this date, a constable to post notice, and any other participation the town normally has for a special town meeting. In the alternative, we seek the Board of Selectmen to place our article before the voters at the November election and we seek the selectmen to decide this issue at their next selectmen meeting. The November election would assure greater participation by the public because elderly voters and all other voters could have all day long to vote and they could even vote by mail. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much. Other comments from the public on non-agenda item? Not seeing any, we'll move on to our second item, which is the discussion and approval of the board minutes from July 6, 2022. Does the board have any comments on the meeting minutes that are in the packet? Not hearing any kind of a motion to accept, please. Second. Motion made in the second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? 5-0. Thank you very much. We have three items on the public uh, public hearing and I'm going to go over the regulations because there may be somebody here that wants to speak to any one of the three. The purpose of the public hearing is to allow the public to provide input to the select board on any matter that's being deliberated by the board. I would ask that anybody in the public would like to speak to re identify themselves and please address the issue for or against to just speak to it. Um, please be courteous, uh, uh, timely, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, when I get through it, all the public who wishes to, um, uh, to comment, I will close the public hearing and revert to the select board deliberation. There will be no more discussion with the public at that point unless a board, has, a board member has a question of anyone who has previously spoken from the public. So with that, the first item we have on the agenda for public hearing is the Camden Code Adoption Ordinance, my screen just went blank, which is basically a digitization of our town um, codes and ordinances using general code program. I'm not sure if there's anybody from the public would like to comment to that item. If you're not seeing any, I will close the public on that and revert to select board. Uh, Audra, do you want to give a two second? Yes. So. Um 
this is actually something that's long overdue. It's not just digitizing the code. It's also condensing it into a code of ordinances instead of having a bunch of, you know, loose ordinances that we, you know, try our best to, you know, manage and um, keep updated and, and everything else that we need to do to make sure that, um, you know, we're displaying the most recent copy to the public. Uh, in the charter, um, before it was amended in um, 2021, this was required, but it was something that just never got done for whatever reason. A lot of municipalities in Maine have codes of ordinances instead of, you know, a, a variety of loose ordinances. So, you know, the um, adoption of the new charter as well as the digitization process really gave us a good opportunity to make sure that we um, didn't let this uh, charter provision slip through the cracks again. Okay. Um, board, do you have any questions, discussion on this matter? Allison, go ahead. So what exactly are we, are we approving the format? Are we approving the, um, the idea I, I would think is that there aren't any changes. It's not, it's changing a format and the way that it's accessed, but not any of the words or. Right, so there, there are a few things that um, were cleaned up, like there were a few redundancies that are sort of pointed out in the memo that uh, Janice put in your packets. Yeah. Um, you know, ordinances that when they were originally passed, there was no statute um, that was, you know, sort of prevailing at mm -hmm. the time. And, you know, things, things have changed where some of them are redundant now because there's a state statute that addresses it. So, you know, it also gave us the opportunity to go through and do a little bit of cleanup. But you're right, Allison, there's nothing, you know, substantive um, in policy level that's been changed. It's more of, you know, formatting and condensing and indexing so that everything's more easy to find than, you know, when we had them in separate ordinances and we had them as subsections or chapters within that. So, well, let's, let's talk well, to the well, you it's fine. Oh, yeah. sort of a follow up on that, like a, like a, not a rebuttal, but a, so um, I guess what, you know, there were just a, first of all, I would have liked to be able to see it in the digital form online because it's hard to, since the entire purpose is to make it easier for people to find things, it's really hard to evaluate that in this format. But there were a couple things that just, um, obviously I haven't memorized exactly the way it was before, but there were a couple of things that jumped out at me, um, just having remembered like annotations from the past. Um, it might seem really minor, but like in the parking ordinance, there was something about um, the speed limit being changed on Molino Road, for instance. And I had just been looking at this, and in the old version, the annotation said something to the effect of, uh, you know, changed by select board something, something 2003. Now there's, now the annotation is changed or updated 2003. And in an ordinance that is already really hard to understand which, who has the authority to do what and the history of things. And I really don't want to lose any of those little annotations. Um, I mean, I think the whole thing probably needs to be repealed and replaced the parking ordinance. But since we do have it, I just don't, I'm nervous that there might be a, a, a bunch of other things like that, that I haven't had a chance to really dissect. Um, I, I, and that I was sort of assuming that it was going to be like a com that it was going to be a complete, and we weren't. There wasn't going to be a risk of losing anything. Um, so what we could do is just you know move forward with this tonight, so that we can move forward with the digitization process. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would make it easier for you to all go back through it yep, you know, yep, when it's at yep, that point. Yep. And if there's anything like that that sort of jumps out at us, we can bring it back you, and you, fix it. You up have there. the ability to yep. change it again because um, the way that you're given authority in the charter, it's not something. This isn't you know an ordinance that needs to go back to voters for approval. Right, this is right. something that the select board yep, has. If, authority over. if there's a lot of annotations that we're missing, we can, in worst case, we could bring it to a workshop and work on it. We'll like, I just want to feel good about the end result of how it's organized and that, that we're like, yes, this accomplishes what we wanted to. So if, if we could get another chance to look at it once it's digitized, that would, that would be great. And I'm really happy. Thank you for, I know this is a huge,
yeah. undertaking. Janice, I mean, uh, thanks, Janice. All of those separate documents. It's My question was going to be: uh, Could you give it, a, give us an example of conflicts, redundancies, and inconsistencies? Inconsistencies, but I think those will be apparent when we see the yes, and also size version in comparison. One in Janice's memo, it had to do with fishing. Um, <laughs> Sure, yeah, 1936. Yeah. I like that. Um. <laughs> I, think was, I think that was probably the one that jumped out, and, I, and it's stuck in my mind. But I think, you know, there are a few others that are probably going to come mm -hmm. up. And the fact that it's going to be easier to read now that it's digitized, we're right. going to find many, many Yeah, I, 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 I think we're, as I understand it, we're required to approve this filing, filing, digitization filing system. That's what it is, not that everything in there is correct to date. Right. Right. I mean, the you, you sure? know the idea is that it's as it's as close to what the voters passed as possible. Right. Um, but like we said, things change, and you know, Janice does an excellent job of keeping track of the record. Um, but there are things that you know, I think that we'll all look at and see that right. need to be updated a little bit. And so, what would that process be if we so see things? Once and also, I think. You know, I don't want you to um, feel pressured to pass this either because we do need to have a hard copy available to the public. And this is the hard copy that will be available to the public. So it still is really important that you're all comfortable with this version. Um, but I think that when we get the electronic version, and if you want to see now kind of what it looks like, I know the city of Belfast uses the same, mm -hmm. they, do. they use the same right. software. Um, That'll just give you an idea of what it'll look like to search through and, and how everything's laid out. Um, but we could, like Bob said, either have a workshop to sort of go through it or, you know, depending on well, how um, able uh, you're all uh, mm -hmm. are to look at it on your own, we could do it at a uh, meeting. Yeah, you know, what I want to say, we could approve the, fact, the digitization part, but the proviso that you'll get us the electronic version and then by some date certain after that, we'd have to provide comments to close it out. Correct, yes. And if you notice anything that you didn't notice in the hard copy in the digital version, you know, we'll be able to make changes to both. When will the digital version be ready for us to start that review? Do you have any idea? That's a Janice question. Janice. Your main purpose tonight is just to adopt the code That's. The come okay. Right. So once. That we can actually do it. You know, so we'll just approve the, the code okay. ordinance and then we will, when, when it comes out, we'll make a decision on when comments are due back. How's that? Okay, okay. I move so, to pass yeah, this. Go ahead. You need my mic. Yes, I need your mic. Um, are we also thinking about digitizing the forms and uh, automating the forms uh, since we're looking into that? And if we're digitizing the forms, I know there's a couple of forms that Alison and I have been wanting to revise because some questions are completely obsolete and inappropriate. And inappropriate. So do we need to have, uh, schedule a workshop for this and just have an entire, you know, it's a admin year. ordinance forms day? <laughs> I know it's super exciting, right? I think but that can we do that? happen. We can make that decision later. Yeah, and that's, that's all going to be through the, um, uh, sorry, I'm... Oh no! The, the, the programs mixed up in my head. The um, I work system. So we're really we're really looking for a motion to approve the Camden Code Adoption Ordinance tonight. So and, moved. So, and a second, anybody? Uh, so, so I don't. I just don't like the like. What does Camden comma T mean at the top of? Uh, again, we're just before approving but the I ordinance, we were... not the content. We're gonna we're gonna get a digitiz digitized. But this is the hard. This is the paper copy. So we still want that to be under. I'm just trying to understand what when the appropriate mm. time is to. When we get like, the electronic version. I know, but there's going to be a non-electronic version too. And are we saying that we're this is all just? Is this the last opportunity to comment on? No, the, no, we'll no. we'll have to change no. both. Like if there's anything that you no. notice in the digital version, it'll have to, you know it'll mm -hmm. have to be changed in the paper copy. Okay. This is the process we're approving right now. That's all. Just the digitization through the Camden. What have we called it? The Camden. Uh, Camden Code Adoption code Ordinance. Adoption. Ordinance. Yeah, you're, you're basically Second. creating the code of ordinances instead Second. of having Second. a bunch of separate. So I'm seconding. Okay, motion made and seconded. Further discussion? Not hearing any, all those in favor? 5 0, thank you. The second item on the public hearing is the with respect to the Whitehall 
and at 52 High Street for the renewal of the Class 1 Hotel Liquor License. Does anyone here from the public want to speak to this application? Not seeing anyone who closed the public hearing in virtue to a deliberation by the select board for this for this uh, for this uh, liquor license. And, and you have a motion to uh, make to a motion to approve the is it a No, like it, liquor license it's class Whitehall. one liquor class license. Liquor, li liquor license for Whitehall. Yeah. Okay. I need a drink. I need a drink. Do I have a second? <laughs> Do I hear a second? Tom, thank you. Second. Thank you, Tom. And uh, with that, uh, any for the discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. <laughs> Lastly, we have um, an application from Lucky Betty's at 46 Elm Street for the renewal of a Class A lounge liquor license. Somebody from the public here that'd like to speak to this one? Just say, oh, just say hi. Just, just, just say hi if you'd like. It's up to you. Hi. Oh. <laughs> And well, I don't think you have to. It's so oh, popular. But she should. Well, still, like, you know. in my work clothes. I think <laughs> Did you get today. the water out? Yeah, I got the water out. Okay. But that's why I'm still in this. Um, that, I don't know. We've just been open introduce for yourself. A year. That's all. Just introduce yourself. Dupree, Lucky Betty. And I can tell you, you're doing a great job. That place is so popular. Thank you. We, we, but sometimes wish it was open more nights. Um, I know. Eventually. <laughs> Anyway, as much yeah. as I can. Yes, good, good, good job. Good job. Good yeah. job. But it, it, I really appreciate it. it. Not a problem. Um, with with that, I'll close the public comments and revert to the decision by the select board regarding the. Class, so make a motion that we approve Lucky Betty's renewal of a Class A lounge liquor license. Second. Second by Tom. Thank you. Uh, discussion. All those in favor. Oh. <laughs> you got it. Thank Go you. Back. Thanks for showing up. Good to see you again. No, but it, we like it. It's yeah. really nice when you yeah. with we, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. it. All right. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> On the consent agenda, we have two, uh, well, two major items. One is the uh, uh, list of victuals license, which are the Birchwood, Camden, Cuzzies, Lucky Betty's, Oyster River Wine Growers, Timber Cliff Cottages, Uncle Willie's Candy Shop, and Zoot Coffee. The second item on the consent agenda is to appoint, as we do annually, Parker S. Lake Jr. to the Pascal Fund Trust. Are there any objections to the items on the consent agenda? Not hearing any uh, or seeing any, that they are hereby adopted. Going to our action items, we have the first one is an amendment to the Camden Police Department Collective Bargaining Agreement. Audrey, could you give a brief intro here? That might be helpful. So I had to call Randy and ask him about this. And from what I understand, this is, again, stuff that happened while I was gone. Could I bring Randy on? Or? Actually, yeah, I, that's Please. probably better. Thank you, Allison. Thank from, you. Thank from you. the horse's mouth okay. instead of second Thank you. Right. Me. Yes. It's like separation of fun to speculate while not letting him in and just make him mm -hmm. sweat it out. Raise your hand. Exactly. Get stressed out when I say the wrong thing. <laughs> Here he is. Good evening. Hello, Randy. We, as you know, we're uh, discussing the, the um, uh, um, amendment, I guess it is, to the bargaining agreement. Could you please describe it and what, what generated yes. and how we uh, got here? When we went through contract negotiations, uh, we were also simultaneously doing a personnel policy update and uh, bonus vacations was part of that discussion in the personnel policy. Uh, yeah, however, it wasn't done when we were in contract negotiations. And all we want to do is bring the contract vacations uh, in compliance with the personnel policy. And that's bonus vacations for milestone anniversaries 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50, which uh, the town employees all get right now, including myself and my lieutenant. And we would just like to uh, recognize our department employees who also have reached those milestones. Because as you know, finding help is quite, uh, quite hard. And when we have people that are staying with us for a number of years, I think they ought to uh, get that as well. Mm -hmm. Questions, board? Allison. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I, I recognize that anybody under the union contract would see that there's something that the non-union employees are getting um, and want that 
too, but I think generally there's a reason why, you know, it's, it would, it is very typical for there to be things that are different between a union contract and a personnel policy we, and sort of the benefit of, so I don't, I mean, I wouldn't automatically think that just because you know, there are benefits to being in a union and there are benefits probably to not being in a union and um, I don't know, I, I'm generally. Historically, they, historically, things that aren't addressed in the contract fall back to the personnel policy. And we would have negotiated, or the union would have negotiated that, but it was still in the process in the personnel policy at that time. That's why it didn't come up in negotiation. I mean, I guess there are, there are benefits that, that members of the police union have that town employees don't have. For instance, there's nothing in the personnel policy that says we can't give a lie detector test or, a, you know, there, there are things that the, that the police union put in there that regular town employees aren't entitled to. So I guess I see them as, as different. It's not that I have any issue with giving people more um, benefits. I can recognize the value of that, but it feels like it was a separate conversation and I don't know. Other comments? Go ahead, oh. Stephanie. Uh, uh, Randy, uh, did you want to respond to that, Randy, or, or I was going to get other questions? I'm making the recommendation. Uh, it's up to you to decide if that's the way you want to go or not. Stephanie. So for uh, full disclosure, I was the chair of the personnel committee when this was uh, recommended to the board back in 2020, 2021. So I, um, I am in full agreement that this is a necessary step to offer things that compensate more than just money. Um, in the world we live in right now, police, fire, EMS, any sort of public service, people like that are under so much stress that to choose to go into that profession is, I would think, a pretty scary situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that this anniversary extra week that's offered to the town employees is necessary for our police department as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, so, so this contract, I wasn't obviously a part of the board at the time. This contract was uh, approved July 1st through uh, 2022 through June 30, 2025. Um, and at the time that this contract was negotiated and approved was uh, the additional vacation time, which I believe is what we're voting on tonight. Was that discussed in any way or... Uh, um, brought to anybody's attention that this was something that would be or could be coming forward in the you know a month later or a few weeks later well we didn't have a timeline Tom on when that was going to be approved through the personnel policy so uh, at that point it wasn't approved so and the personnel policy have... wasn't approved until and what it is it's it's a longevity appreciation basically is what it is for our officers right. who uh, you know make that milestone it's the 10 the 20s the 30s right. We don't have anybody that's got 40 yet, but I'm, I'm holding out that I'm going to make it. But we'll see. Uh, the person can I also make one more? I personally think it's a goodwill gesture to our officers to show them that they are appreciated for making those, uh, those extra yeah. years. What are the milestones? What do you have to get to? Just for the record, the personnel policy was approved by the board in May, I believe. Even though Stephanie's uh, right, was it was before? drafted back in 21, Correct. I believe, but it was on a shelf. And for COVID. a long, way too long a time period mm -hmm. and was finally approved at that point. So it was very late in the process and that's what Randy's referring to. Go ahead, so I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, you're gonna have the mic. Thank you. So my question is, when we approved the, bargain, the union bargaining agreement between the police and the union last time it came to the board, we could not look into specific provisions Right, we were asked to either approve or reject the contract. So I'm not understanding why we are asked uh, to approve this addition, given that we, we had no say 
on the whole contract. So I'm just I'm asking a, a procedural point, I guess, that why is this coming to the board? Because if it's approved between the police chief and the union and becomes part of the police bargaining agreement, then we don't have a say. Uh, or we, we, the, the select board should not be approving or disapproving. I'm, I'm just trying to understand the difference here in the process. Yeah, I think that it's, is it's, an it's, interesting. It's, oh, Stephanie, you wanted to go first. Go ahead. You had a hand up. Yes. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to make the point that in um, in the personnel policy, um, I may not be saying that well, but um, how vacations are taken are it's very well laid out. And um, in my knowledge of how everybody negotiates, how that happens in the town, it's talked about and everybody's coverage is taken into account pretty strongly. So offering this extra is an only positive thing in mm -hmm. my Mm -hmm. uh, Randy, isn't this, um, you said earlier that normally you um, followed the personnel policy of the town uh, without having to go to special wording to that effect? Is that what I heard? If, if we have something that isn't addressed in the contract, then we re have reverted very rarely, but we have reverted back to what the personnel policy says. Yeah, it's just from that perspective, I see this as more of a recognition of the town that the police department is recognizing that part of the personnel policy without really having to change the bargaining agreement. Well, I think that bargaining agreement spells out vacation. Right. And so, so there's, you to have to change it. We, you know, that was part of the agreement and it's going to well, have to be then, changed. Then if we, have we, uh, we, we're able to do side agreements with the town on, uh, that's on what I thought. things that come up during the contract years, if there's something that needs to be amended. That's the way, this is one modest, positive change, so I agree with you, Stephanie. Because, um, you know, in the end of the day, the result of the people across the aisle in the fire department are getting these benefits. So I have a problem with not figuring out a way for the police department to have those benefits. Mr. Mr. Tom, next. Thank you. Uh, Randy, you mentioned that retention is an issue. Um, uh, could you expand on that a little bit? I, I, I I'm struggling with maybe, you know, a 10-year, one-week vacation being a significant factor in retention. Retention is an issue nationwide in every police department. And part of the problem with we have for retention is many departments are offering extremely high sign-on bonuses, uh, better schedules. It's pretty much officers can shop wherever they want. If you go to some departments, you could pick up a $20,000 sign-on bonus, work there two years, get your 20000 then move on to the next one that's uh, giving a $20,000 bonus. Uh, we've been fortunate. Our, our staff has stayed uh, pretty steady. The, uh, the bottom positions usually turn over. Um, I still have one open position, and we just haven't found the right uh, person to fill that at this point. But, yeah. We can't compete with sheriff's departments telling them they give them a car the first day that they go to work. They are assigned a vehicle. Right. And, awesome. you know, if you don't keep the wages up and you don't stay competitive, right. uh, you know, the days of people coming to work for a, a municipality and staying there their whole career are very rare mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much opportunity out there. So, Randy, I very briefly looked at the bargaining agreement. Did, um, there are certain things that the town is required to do and certain rights that the police officers have and, and that sort of thing. Um, do you, is there any minimum requirement when you hire an officer? Do you make them sign a contract or anything? Like no, that? We, we don't sign employment contracts with them, quite honestly. I, I can't tell you if we could make them sign a contract to come to work here. But the state has put in place, uh, if we send an officer to the police academy, if they leave the department within five years, is a prorated fee that the agency who hires them has to pay us for reimbursement. Mm -hmm. And it's first year out is 40,000, then it decreases uh, like eight or 9,000 per year till the, uh, till the year five is up. So that's, that's hard, you know, officers uh, with one year experience want to go somewhere else. Uh, you've got departments that have got to pay out 40,000 to the sponsoring agency that hired them and put them through the academy for reimbursement. Uh, some departments are paying it just to get people uh, to fill their ranks. Yeah. Allison. 
So I absolutely want the town to be extremely competitive and an attractive place to work, and I can absolutely recognize the benefit of, of doing that, and I would hope that every time we, we do these contracts, we're thinking about that. Um, I, what concerned me about the bonus vacation for the, the, in the personnel policy as well, and that was something that um, I didn't dwell on or necessarily fully understand reading over all those different things. You know, we each look at different mm -hmm. elements of mm -hmm. it, and so it was sort of after the fact um, that it, you know, the first, the first milestone is 10 years. Is that right? And so you get an extra week at 10 years, yep. and then if you've been here for 20 years, you get an extra two weeks. Yep. People who've been here for 30 years get it. So this first time, it was you know, it's all of a sudden, people are getting, you know, for some of these long-term employees that already long-term employees already get quite a lot of vacation comparatively with some jobs, and so then adding that on is a little bit of a of a hit potentially to the town, and I'm sure the town manager can sort all that out and make sure that it doesn't impact, that we don't have too many shortages, but it does feel like there are a, a lot of efforts that are made to retain the, the people who have been here for longer, and I'm supportive of that, but um, you know, one of the things that came up in the personnel policy was that we still hadn't addressed the fact that you, that new people that are newly hired don't get any benefits until, or don't get any vacation time until after being here for a year. And we brought that up during the meeting, and that was addressed. Um, but it it kind of made me feel like, well, what is what is the process for soliciting input also from all of the employees? Generally speaking, the ones who have been here for a really long time kind of know how to advocate for themselves, but the people who have been here for less time mm -hmm. don't necessarily know, how, you know, they, I, I talked to plenty of people that didn't know that the personnel policy was up for discussion. It had been recommended by the personnel board in 2020 or something and then not rediscussed. So I guess I would like to see us also really making a concerted effort to be super competitive for the, the new people too. Um, because 10 years is a long time to stay for to right. stay somewhere but already. The, the fundamentally, you know, we're dealing so, with a problem. Well, almost stop. We, 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 I would share some of the comments you made about my own hindsight and looking at this benefit. But it is, in fact, has been approved by the select board. It's, it's right now. It is what it is. What we're discussing here tonight is whether or not that should cover all the cross-section of employees of our town. And in this case, because it's a union agreement, that's, that, that's simply what it is. It, it, I agree, Tom, also, I think, you know, the employees, you probably know this as well as anybody, trying to keep them around for 10, 20 years, ain't so simple sometime. And it may not be as big an incentive, but the bottom line, it does no harm as far as trying to keep as, as an incentive I'm talking about, right. whether I like it or not, but it is a fact. Audra. I could offer a suggestion sure. so that, you know, you're, allowing the police department to have the same benefit as everyone else, mm -hmm. but you're not opening up the CBA again, because mm -hmm. I can understand why mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to do that. I have mm -hmm. a little bit of discomfort with it, just mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's it's kind of like... We're not looking, we're not looking, we're looking, that would be a side agreement is what we're looking for, not to open everything back up. Right, well, I, I'm right. saying like if you, we could specifically address it in the personnel policy, to yeah. make it very clear that it applies to the police officers. That's, well. I would, I would totally agree with and you. And so, and then when we come around three years totally to do agree. the CBA again, we if, can, if they feel very strongly that that language needs to be included in the CBA, we can, we can do it. That's in three then. years. So that's when what, is the next time the personnel policy will be? This, we can, I mean, we can do that triggers whenever. That. That, that's, there's no limit. You can the do it next year. Personnel board, though, uh, um, the current elected officials have to term out and then the select board will assign people onto that board going forward. So it would be up to that chairperson to make a meeting. Be, to it's it's also triggered by the time now manager. because it was sort of swept up in the charter changes. Yes. So it's, a, it's a committee now. Yes. And yes. so you, you know, the, the board will need to decide um, how you want to um, 
you know, referred. appoint people and, and right. what you want to charge that committee with because it's it's advisory. And so the select right. board will right. be sort of the final word on, right. you know, changes right. to the personnel policy to get approved. Right. People have to term out first. Yes. Yes. Yeah. When will that happen? Uh, one one more question. question. Go ahead, Sophie. Two years. Um, um, Randy, I'm just uh, assuming that we've looked at the budget implication of the change in the policy. I can make it work. I don't have and make it work. You don't need more money. Yeah, our officers are good at covering shifts, and uh, if we need to slide some people to cover that to to give those employees that benefit, I'm not worried about it at all. Thank you. So what we're looking at then would be a, uh, a modification to the personnel policy uh, to incorporate the rather than hitting the CBA. Uh, mm -hmm. That sounds like a logical approach to me. How does that work, though, if, this, if the collective bargaining agreement actually has language that specifically says something, and then we have another document that contradicts it? I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, think, I don't think it's contradiction. Suggest, I think it's, it's elaboration. Supplemental. It's yeah. supplemental. It's not, it's not contradicting. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't mm -hmm. take away any rights. It increases. It's, it's oh, adding so just like in addition to those things mentioned in the... Right. Right. motion to approve Randy's recommendation of adding the bonus vacation service benefit I, I, to the personnel policy. To the personnel policy. I, I, I just have one more. I, Let's wait till we get a second. Oh, we're, not in this, second we're not in discussion, discussion yet? I'm sorry. Oh, That's okay, sorry. I thought we were approving. Not a problem. I apologize. Um, I just, I, I understand the the feeling like you know one week at 10 years isn't necessarily going to motivate a two-year employee to stay on for another eight um, but it is the feeling of being appreciated and maybe seeing a colleague earn that week yeah and and i can understand that and i appreciate that um i do have a little bit of a heartburn with um opening a settled contract um we're not, that, we're not, we're not. i understand but this this is this way. was an independent so they have the police. I understand in the, uh, negotiate their contract a little bit differently than the other town departments. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So it's, it's unionized. It's union. Correct. So it's a three-year contract, right. and that that contract's good for three years, and then they have another opportunity to negotiate it in 2025. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. I, I think that's the more appropriate time for this. I I just do. I I think that I mean I I sign contracts every week, um, and that's that how contracts are go yeah, I again I, I I believe it's a it's a fairness situation where you know people across the aisle are getting this benefit if they are around long enough it does it again I I'm not in love with the 10 year 20 year 30 year thing either as I look back on it but it is approved it's in the personnel policy and and we can work to change that later which would affect the police department also because it's in a separate agreement not in the collective bargaining agreement if we decided to change at some point in time that issue in the personnel it would uh, uh, policy it would change the police department too oh so it could be taken away at any time that's correct yeah could I, it? Also think that's like you, I mean you approve the personnel policy yeah, that's in our power so, so that, that would be the difference here is that it doesn't we're not locking ourselves not that I'm saying we're going to change it because we're not going to, but philosophically, we could. We we could take that that's true. away without it, you know, being we're not locked in for that's three right. years, that's and so the, that's the advantage of doing it this way, Tom, is to going through the personnel policy rather than trying to change an agreement, a union agreement. And if it comes up in 2025, I I would support it. I think. Oh, yeah. again. I, I, Anyway, I, mean, we, I do we, think it would be my. Uh, I I agree wholeheartedly with, with with Tom. Mm -hmm. Although I don't want to, you know, sticking to that like high-headedness of it. I, I yeah. think the implications might be that it's too demoralizing mm -hmm. for people who are comparing. It, it would be like a slap in the face, and I don't want to right. to do that. It, it, but. I do think that the other town employees, by being part of that personnel policy, they have to go through that excruciating up and down every year of knowing, figuring, what is the budget committee going to say about the COLA? Yeah, yeah. What is this? What is that? And it's this, like, yeah. every year kind of on trial, wondering what's going to happen, whereas the police department, by having that union 
um, is insulated from the that ups, up and down. So I, well, I think good. it's important to recognize We can to send him over to the police department and fill that department up so yeah, Brandy right. doesn't I, have to go looking. I think we've, uh, <laughs> we, I think we've, we're down to a point where we're, we're amending a document that can't, uh, uh, that can, that can be re-amended if we want to, uh, including the whole uh, issue of the 10, 20, 30 year. I think it's simple, it's straightforward, and we have a motion and a second. I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Can you tell me one more time what we're voting on? Okay, absolutely, Tom. We, well, the motion is to, in the personnel policy, where we talk about this 10, 20, 30, to include the police department in that document. That's what we're talk, voting on. Okay. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, all those in favor again? 5-0. Thank you. Well, good discussion, by the way. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. And I uh, speak on behalf of all the officers of the police department. Thank you. Sure. Um, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Take care. Uh, the next item is, to, is a, a minor, well, not minor, it's an amendment to the parking traffic regulations. Let's do there. <laughs> to, uh, yeah, stay there. Stay to, there. To, to, to add parking meter fine citations as a temporary measure for one year. Obviously, as it says, this is for the paid parking uh, pilot program at the pub on the public landing. And I guess the bottom line here is we modified parking fines for street parking when your tire has been marked and all that kind of thing, but we didn't cover parking meter specifically as a fine. Is that correct? Bob? Yes. Can I jump in? Just, yes. Can, yes. Don't get, don't get hung up on the meter because I think that's referring to the kiosk because that actually is a meter. We're not putting individual meters down there. Well, I, what that's going to be good is a fine if somebody's at an expired meter. And that was uh, recommended by uh, John Burke and the fine amount is consistent with uh, up and down the coast for that violation. And that was also recommended by the advisory committee on the parking. Yeah. Study. We discussed it, we just were waiting for the wording. Okay. So I make a motion that we approve the experiment, the experimental amendment to parking ordinance, part four of the Canon Penis Ordinance. Mm -hmm. Is it experimental or temporary? Just out of curiosity. It's experimental, but it's also temporary. It, so means, it means that we don't have to change the whole code. Yeah, yeah. For I just one year, Experiments. Okay. Can either renew it for one year or I thought it was two years. Written as experiment. Okay, thanks. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, discussion. Stephanie. Uh, discussion. Further discussion. Oh, it, oh, oh Stephanie. I just, um, this fine. Um, so it's a three hour parking. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean the $30? So, when I park illegally on the street, and I'm sorry I don't anymore because I work from home, Randy, so you probably have, you know, you probably can't go buy extra stuff because of my fines. Um, but when I did, it was every hour. I, I mean, I only got one because people would tell me. But how would this work? <laughs> How would this? Is it three every three hours they would get another $30 fine or is it every hour? How would it work? I don't know. If you, if, if you stay longer than the three hours, then you're an expired meter. That's what that fine is. Okay. So if they stay six, they stay nine hours. They park in the morning and they leave at, they only get a $30 fine? Well, they, they're going to have to pay the... Uh, initial and if they don't do that this is to a deterrent for people to right. try to figure this out of parking at expired meters right get time so when the officer is going to make his rounds uh, we have the option of the overtime parking which is there I, I believe I got to do a little more research on that but mm -hmm. uh, we also have it's going to be that person who stays the fourth or fifth hour it'll be a straight $30 fine okay And, oh, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, w historically, we've had two-hour parking, correct, Randy? Yes. Okay. In in the past, if somebody went over two hours, how much was the fine? Ten. Ten dollars. Ten dollars. So we're upping the amount. And if they was that, did that basically give them a a permit to park I, along the lines of Stephanie's question? Like, at what point did you continue to find them every hour? Or? They would be uh, every round, so every two hours they'd pick up another ticket. Another ticket, and, and, and it increased in in, in the fine. In, We've gone to in magnitude. 20, yeah. 20, 
And could you just clarify me to me one more time how this differs from that? So it'll be a, a thirty dollar fine for over three hours, and again every it's three gonna hours. Be a 30, it's going to be a thirty dollar fine if you are at an expired meter, straight up, because we're doing ten hours a day times. Two is 20, so what the fine is actually higher than what it would cost to park there all day. I think that's how that's, John has figured that out. Thank you for that, that math. I was so trying, Randy. And now, just so we are clear, the public landing is the only place that's going to have three hour parking. Mm -hmm. On the streets is still going to be free two hour parking. If you park longer than two, then you're subject to a ticket on the streets. Right. And if you stay there longer than that, then you're subject to increased fines every round that the officer goes through. So, so in that sense, what we're having is we have two concurring, competing fine systems because we still have, imagine like an analog system on the street with an officer walking and mm -hmm. a chalk mark, mm -hmm. but then we have the kiosk and a digital, <coughs> digital process with those kiosks at the public landing. So that's why we need to have that. That's why we need to have that specific um, mm -hmm. uh, ordinance to make sure that that we we actually um, give them we don't tickets. Have a violation for that exactly, right that we give them tickets that are legal. So that's that's what we we're did, doing. We did already change. Were you guys here when we changed the fees? We changed the, the fees. Yeah, no, for the regular tickets, they weren't they weren't there yet. No, so we did just, that. So those tickets for regular street parking yeah. have already gone up. Right. To the same, I think it goes about 20, 40, 50. 20, 40, 50. We, we have them 10, 10 okay. Okay. That was approved in late May. <coughs> early, early, early. Yeah, early. Because yeah, early. so many people, yeah. when they found out the ticket was $10, they, they were like happy to pay that. Right. It was totally a heck of a lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, we have a uh, motion in a second to accept this mo uh, modification to this uh, temporary um, measure. Any further discussion? Yes, that was in So I know that I'm sure this was discussed a lot by the um, committee, and I watched some of those meetings, but not all of them. Um, the 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 big thing that concerns me was seeing that three hour limit because um, considering the number of day sailor um, guests. Yep. Um, I mean, that to me, you're already paying, you know, fifty dollars a ticket to go out on a day sailor, a lot of a lot of those people are going to choose to, I assume, to park down there when they couldn't before. And at least, um, so so to me, the idea was like we're, we're increasing turnover and allowing more people to come into town and leave. The day sailors already had a system where they were getting people in other places. And yep. now it feels like we are turning that into just a day sailor lot. I mean, I'm sure that's just going to be something that are we going to monitor that? And sure. I spend probably like four or five hours on the public landing every day. So I you're going to monitor it? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I, think, I think one of the. I mean, one of. So I just. Well, I'm, I'm gonna get it, it's going to change who you know the group that can be. I, I think this whole thing with this. We're not debating the the details of the system tonight. We're talking about a fine to be added for uh, a, a kiosk violation. Now, whether it should be three or two or yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this happened in Belfast, too. It wasn't the only location. So when they mine aggregate to build, to make the asphalt, yep. they can hit an iron pocket, yep. and it ends up being in the, in the aggregate. It doesn't change the integrity of the pavement, but it makes it ugly. Yep. And, and I, you can ask yeah. the town manager, I, I, I was just, I mean, if, if anybody's upset about it, it's me, because I hate that stuff. <laughs> I'm very well, particular. I actually appreciate that because I wasn't even involved with anything on the select board when that happened and people were emailing me if I knew why. <laughs> it drives me crazy. I tried everything I could to get the guy to redo it. Um, yeah. But all I come to is that, you know, since lesson. he can't fix it, I'm not going to include him in the, you know, lesson learned. I mean, they're typically a good company to work with, but I guess right. the, you know, the response we got from this issue just made it easier to exclude them. And Understood. And it, it, it does happen, and it's usually a bad batch of asphalt. I could have got them on a failure of the integrity of the, con of the asphalt. Yeah. Um, and that happened in another place I was at. I ended up having them repave, and it cost them $60,000 to repave the road. This one, 
there was there's no integrity difference between you know I looked around there's really it's just an aesthetic thing yep um, and it it reacts with the paint the paint is uh, water based and when you add water to iron you get rust yep. and that's what ends up happening yep. so um, that's my only question I had I wish I could here. do this and make it go away I hate it Allison, go ahead. Um, uh, so just, I know this is very, very difficult and unlikely to keep all um, paving contractors from smoking cigarettes, and that would severely limit our options. But um, is there, a, could you suggest that they limit the amount that they smoke while following up on Peter, not that I'm jumping onto all of Peter's comments, but. So I can suggest that they can just not paving, uh, not smoke like the, while they're paving, but around I mean, other people and. Yeah, I mean, you, I can ask them and tell them that we request that they don't pave on uh, smoke while they're paving on the sidewalk. I mean, and but uh, it's a. Or not throw them. I don't think I know a paving contractor that doesn't good. have a crew that smokes. That's that's one of the issues. But you know, we can ask them. We can re we can put it in the contract next time that you can't. You can't try. smoke while you're paving. You can, yeah. yeah, you can try, uh, except for you know the asphalt, hot I'm asphalt. I'm not saying I know that's not. I, I'm not in a different world. I'm I think I'm probably you. a nice going over and talking with them when and, when they do yeah. the sidewalk to just say, hey guys, you know, just or gentlemen and ladies and gentlemen, if there's women that are paving too, I don't want to be. So but designated there, but, smoking um, area for the group to have. Please, a please refrain from smoking as much as you can. Right. Um, if right. you want to smoke, I right. prefer that you take a break and go somewhere else and smoke. I have a, a last question for you, Dave, if I may. Um, so I know there's like a million different ways of resurfacing roads, and I'm just curious if, if we're looking into environmental friendly or more permea permeable surfaces, and if it's something that you could think about asking for bids just so, just so that we know the cost of putting surfacing that is that will you know, drain water or, or there, I know there are different ways to do this so, because I have no idea if it, if it doubles the cost per thousand feet or whatever. I think it would be interesting just for the education of the public to know mm -hmm. that the choices we make in terms of the, mm -hmm. uh, the aggregates we use or the, the material we use have an impact on the climate and that if we want to ad address this, it's going to cost us X amount more. Uh, so just as an information, I think I, I would value it personally. So, so we're we're doing we're trying to pay we're trying to redo Pearl Street, and we have bids. And one of the first ideas was to use permeable pavement on Pearl Street. You have to do it when you're completely rebuilding the road, yeah. not when. Yeah, you know, and and because you gotta you gotta do work on the sub base, and you gotta put drainage in, and there's a lot of different things that happen. Part of the issue is is when you have a lot of trees and canopy, you have organics, and the organics will clog the pores of the uh, permeable pavement. The permeable pavement is much more expensive to put down and it's specialized by just a few people and a few plants that can do it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's specific situations where we're going to be able to do that, like an open parking lot maybe, mm -hmm. but when you get into a canopy, a, a road under a mm -hmm. canopy, mm -hmm. uh, you, you prematurely age the permeability of the the pavement and then it fails and then basically you have the road that you know just like it was before it's yes. not permeable anymore and you pay twice as much for it interesting just underneath. i think they said there's a lot of clay on pearl street right. somebody well, said was, just it's, that is interesting to me because so you don't like, <laughs> now i understand what much talking about is you you know if you don't have a good place for water to drain to into, yeah it's it's, it's you're creating more of a problem right, so we're always looking at those things on every paving project right. and i i really want to incorporate those things where we can and it's the first thing that comes to my mind when I look, you know, it's the first question I ask, is this yeah. something I can yeah. add, yeah. you know? No, um, understood. You know, it's, it, it's, it's been tried around the country, and it's not just the first cost of laying it in the, in the sub base that makes it work as a long term, how often you're redoing it. And they've, it's, it's been quadruple the cost of asphalt. So it's the, the main mall. Right. Yeah. The parking lot of the main yeah. mall is a good parking example. Lots, it's a success story. You can read the, can the case right. study. We should have probably in hindsight, this was before I got here, mm -hmm. everything was all set in motion, but the, mm -hmm. the parking lot across the street would have been a really good candidate yeah. for that. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And we just, we never, we weren't in that mode at the time. So. Next time. Next time. But, you know, they'll be up maybe when you do the public landing. Yeah. Good, good comment. Yeah. Do I have a, Thank you. I appreciate do I a, it. Do I have a motion to um, uh, recommend a bidder? I make a motion that we approve the bid submitted by performance, performance 
uh, for paving. paving the streets. Uh, a second. For a total of five hundred. paving. Performance paving. Is it the total $589,520, Dave? It, 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 the actual contract amount um, was two hundred sixty-seven seven seventy. The future work was three twenty-one seven fifty. That wasn't incorporated into the total bid price. So I make a motion that we approve the contracts, of the bid submitted by Performance Paving in Owl's Head for an amount of two hundred sixty-seven thousand seven hundred seventy dollars. And Stephanie, you second. Second. For the discussion. We don't have to do the future work. That's not part of no. it. No. Okay. Because we're just disbursing that amount right now. Correct. But we know that future work Correct. might might cost us that. Any further discussion? All those in favor. Thank you, David. Thank you. You should see much. the sidewalk on Washington Street paved in the next couple of days. It's great. Yeah. great news. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. You have a great night. Allison, let's bring on Patrick okay, for Patrick. the next one, please. Um, our, our, we have one discussion item tonight, which is a presentation. Um, I'll wait a second for Patrick to show up. Mm -hmm. I'll um, carry four words, but you can do Patrick oh. first. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Let's, let's get him off. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, you're right ahead of this in those. There he is. So we can see Patrick better. <laughs> I can see him in my Sophie computer. Sophie leaves, turns off the light. No, that's fine. That's fine. Why is he on that screen? Good evening, everyone. Yeah, we don't Good need to. Bob. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Patrick. Good evening. Thank you for waiting. We appreciate it. Um, we uh, understand we have a. Uh, a presentation from you on the results of a traffic study for the Elm Union Street intersection, better known by us as a stop and go uh, intersection. So, with, without further ado, Patrick, please introduce yourself and let's hear the results of your study. Sounds great. Good evening, everyone. I'm Patrick Adams. I'm Maine DOT's active transportation planner, Union Street and Route 1. And um, I got the go ahead from the two of them to approach our traffic folks to do an analysis of this intersection. Mm -hmm. um, before I go too far, I want to make sure that I point out that I am not an engineer. If you start asking questions, I will not know the answers to them. Okay. I know what information was in the report, and I'll do my best to share that with you. Okay. I have copies of the final report that was generated in March of 21, as well as this presentation. At one point, I was planning on being there tonight, uh, and I was going to bring those with me. I'm going to drop those in the mail tomorrow and get them sent down to Audra so that she can, can share them with you in case you have additional questions. Okay. But, um, the whole idea behind doing one of these traffic studies is to use the data and information that you currently have uh, about the intersection, including traffic volumes, turning movements, and things like that, as well as putting it in simulators to give us an estimate on what uh, could reasonably be anticipated at that intersection. Mm -hmm. So this is an overhead shot of, of the intersection. Union Street's coming in from the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, Elm Street, US Route 1, is that yellow line going from the bottom left to the upper right. You guys all know this. This right. is Route 1 looking southbound. This is Route 1 looking northbound, and this is looking up Union Street with, with the stop and go there on the right. What Maine DOT has been long concerned about and, and feels is probably one of the biggest challenges of this intersection is the stop sign that's facing people who are heading north. Uh, it's, it's one of the few instances where the major road, U.S. Route 1, actually yields to a minor roadway, which would be Union Street. Uh, Union Street has a much smaller 
uh, amount of traffic on it compared to Route 1. And there's long been some concerns within Maine DOT about how that impacts traffic flow. So here on the left-hand side, you can see based upon uh, the counts we have, you know, we estimate uh, that north of the intersection, there's on average over the course of the whole year, over 12,000 vehicles that are north of the intersection. Mm -hmm. South of the intersection, there's close to uh, closing in on 11,000 vehicles. And then Union Street only has about 4,200. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see the turning movements. So if you're coming south on Route 1, you'll see um, this is the estimated peak hour activity. So this is peak hour in the afternoon. You can see that going southbound on one, approximately 184 vehicles will turn on to Union Street. Well, 462 will go straight through. Heading north on Route 1, 466 will go straight through with 53 turning on Union Street. And right here, if you're on Union Street and you decide to go south on one, we estimate 95 vehicles. And coming off Union Street going north, 204. Street, US Route 1 is that yellow line going from the bottom left to the upper right. You guys all know this. This oh, yeah. is Route 1 looking southbound. This is Route 1 looking northbound. And this is looking up Union Street with, with the stop and go there on the right. What Maine DOT has been long concerned about and, and feels is probably one of the biggest challenges of this intersection is the stop sign that's facing people who are heading north. Uh, it's, it's one of the few instances where the major road, US Route 1, actually yields to a minor roadway, which would be Union Street. Uh, Union Street has a much smaller uh, amount of traffic on it compared to Route 1. And there's long been some concerns within Maine DOT about how that impacts traffic flow. So here on the left-hand side, you can see based upon uh, the counts we have, you know, we estimate uh, that north of the intersection, there's on average over the course of the whole year, over 12,000 vehicles that are north of the intersection. Mm -hmm. South of the intersection, there's close to uh, closing in on 11,000 vehicles. And then Union Street only has about 4,200. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see the turning movements. So if you're coming south on Route 1, you'll see um, this is the estimated peak hour activity. So this is peak hour in the afternoon. You can see that going southbound on one, approximately 184 vehicles will turn on to Union Street. Well, 462 will go straight through. Heading north on Route 1, 466 will go straight through with 53 turning on Union Street. And right here, if you're on Union Street you, and you decide to go south on one, we estimate 95 vehicles. And coming off Union Street going north, 204. So we use those traffic volumes and those turning movements to do an analysis. Part of that analysis is looking at the crash history. So this is the crash history for the last 10 years, from 2011 through 2020. Um, what you'll notice is there's a whole lot of these turning movements where, where they're coming in contact with a, another vehicle. Mm. These are all instances where vehicles failed to yield the right of way. In this case here, coming off Union Street, they had the right of way and they were struck by vehicles who were going northbound. Mm. Here, you have vehicles who were going southbound who were struck by vehicles coming off Union Street. And then 
for the folks who are heading north, we've got some rear ends, we've got some turning movement things, we have multiple, we've got uh, one, two, three multiple vehicle rear end situations, as well as some yielding problems. So what we really wanna try and do is how can we make things better at this intersection? Uh, you know, is this something we should look at if, you know, closer? Does it address safety issues? How does it impact mobility and, and vehicle movement through there? What's the impact on adjacent properties? That's that right of way column. And then is it a cost effective approach? As we look at this, safety is at the core of our analysis and trying to uh, recognize that there may be minor changes in safety that give us uh, dramatic changes in um, the capacity of the roadway to move vehicles through, as well as our ability to provide uh, access for other roadway users beside just the motor vehicles. So what we're gonna do is take a look at, at the different alternatives mm -hmm. that were out there. What you can see here is one of the alternatives that was explored was moving the stop from Route 1 northbound to making it a Union Street stop. What I want to point out before we delve into this too deep is based upon our studies, the existing condition is the worst case scenario for us. Uh, we have the worst um, traffic volume through the intersection. We have the greatest wait times overall for vehicles and the greatest impact uh, to, uh, to traffic through the town of Camden. So by changing it to a Union Street stop, overall we're getting a, a market improvement in traffic. What we do see here is the greens are positive, the reds are negatives. We do see that people who are on Union Street do have a marked increase in their wait time. It changes from 3.3 seconds to 84 seconds. So that's a pretty big jump. We also see that because we'll no longer have that free flowing traffic on Union Street, the wait, the queue, the wait time changes from 84 feet to 504 feet. We also notice that the southbound Route 1 queue, so the, the folks coming to this intersection from the right, that queue length goes from 33 feet to 150 feet. So there are some negatives here. However, northbound Route 1 goes from 844 feet down to three feet. <clears throat> And northbound Route 1, the, the turning lane queue drops from 320 feet to 8 feet. So what we see is a decrease uh, in the throughput of vehicles on Union Street, a dramatic increase for those who are going northbound on Route 1, and a slight decrease in the capacity for vehicles mm -hmm. that are southbound on 1. Mm -hmm. One of the other alternatives we looked at was making it an all-way stop. So all three legs would come up on a stop sign and take their turns on moving. Even with everybody stopping and taking their turns, we still saw an improvement in traffic. We actually saw that Union Street traffic flow improves from the current conditions. We do see a decrease in that southbound Route 1 traffic flow because they have pretty much free movement right now. Northbound Route 1 traffic improves. Union Street, the typical queue is only about 102 feet. So that's about four vehicles. Southbound Route 1 typical queue ends up being about 355 feet. The northbound Route 1 Q is about 200 feet, so about halfway between those. And northbound Route 1 right turn is only about 70 feet.
We also looked at what would happen at this intersection if we eliminated that dedicated right turn lane and we made it a single northbound route one lane. Overall, there was just a very slight decrease in the overall traffic impact and the, and the impact on drivers. We, we do see that this lane removal, that dedicated right turn lane, does give us some shoulder space that could be used for bicycle lanes or sidewalk installation right by the stop and go. We think that with that increased space, we would see improved bicycle and pedestrian safety. We do notice that the northbound Route 1 traffic delay would increase just slightly from 18.3 seconds to 18.7 seconds. And the northbound traffic queue length would only increase about 46 feet. So about two car lengths. So that's the, the if we chose to make it an always stop and eliminate that dedicated right turn lane. If we wanted to look at putting a signal in, um, we see a substantial overall traffic improvement, greater efficiency through the intersection. By installing a traffic signal that's properly timed, we estimate that the average delay per vehicle would only be about 14.2 seconds. Union Street would be the one who would be impacted the most. They have a slightly increased delay in their wait time. We see improvements to the Route 1 traffic flow. We see a substantial improvement uh, exponentially about almost 10 times uh, the northbound traffic flow. The queue for Union Street's at 175, southbound's 369. The through lane for Route 1 North is 162. And if you're looking at that turning lane, that's only about 37 feet. Mm -hmm. If we take that same signal um, and we only have a single lane in both directions, so we've got one lane northbound, one lane southbound, there's no dedicated turn, left turn lane, there's no dedicated right turn lane. Based upon current conditions, we still see a substantial increase in traffic um, flow through the area. The delay per vehicle actually goes down compared to the previous. Once again, Union Street has a slight delay compared to current conditions. Southbound North One, northbound traffic flow increases and improves on Route One. Union Street has a slightly longer wait, but it's not substantial. And the queue lengths aren't terrible um, for, for southbound as well, or northbound, southbound or northbound. Mm -hmm. If we put in the turn signal with a southbound left turn pocket, so if you're coming to the intersection from the north and want to make a left turn onto Union, we still see huge improvements in traffic flow. The vehicle delay average isn't that much different. Union Street still has that slight delay that we saw before. Southbound Route 1 traffic flow improves. There is a substantial improvement in the northbound traffic flow. The Union Street queuing actually shortens up compared to the previous one where we only had the single lane. Northbound queue isn't, isn't substantially different. Uh, the big thing we see here is that southbound Route 1 left turn lane would only be queuing up to be about 103 feet. So that's four to five vehicles. Everybody, I hear this every time I come to town, everybody wants to know what about a roundabout? What about a roundabout? <laughs> Based upon, you know, um, design standards, if you have a typical semi-trailer going up Route 1, Traditionally, that semi-trailer of average length 
would need between a hundred and a hundred and thirty foot turning radius mm -hmm. to go through this roundabout. Mm -hmm. This inner circle is the one hundred foot uh, diameter for the turning radius. The outside red circle would be that one hundred and thirty foot. So somewhere in here is the amount of space you would need in order to put a single lane roundabout on route one to connect those three roads here's where it gets kind of nasty there are enormous design challenges that have to be overcome in order to put this in um, there's uh, grades and slopes uh, between uh, coming downhill as you're heading north, heading uphill from the south, and then coming in from Union Street. We also know, and you can look here and see the type of impacts that there would be uh, to adjacent property owners, mm -hmm. property owners that have historical significance. Mm -hmm. We think that at this intersection, we would anticipate at least three, if not four property impacts we do think that there would likely have to be at least one building removed and this alternative is easily the most expensive the advantage to this is we would likely see the biggest reduction in the number of crashes at this at this intersection we also think it would generate the greatest improvement to traffic flow union street once again because union street currently has a free flowing condition they're the only one that would experience uh, a greater delay than than the current conditions that's only about 50 feet northbound 75 southbound 100 feet overall that would be about 9.7 seconds delay for each vehicle entering the roundabout. Mm -hmm. It's a ton of information. I know that. And, it, and that's why I think it'll be helpful when I get you the report and, right. and the presentation so you can look at it a little bit deeper. Looking at Union Street as having the one-way stop, it's gonna be the least costly alternative. Whoops, sorry. However, it also gives the lowest benefit to, to all the alternatives we explored. This alternative could allow for the, elim the elimination of the northbound right turn lane, which once again would give us that opportunity to add facilities that could be used by either bicycles or the installation of a sidewalk. If we go to the always stop with the existing configuration it's really a very low cost alternative it provides significant benefit to both mobility and safety so we're moving more vehicles through more efficiently and it increases safety we should see a reduction in the number of crashes however that does not address that northbound right turn lane width uh, for bike and ped accommodation that was one of the things folks wanted us to look at an always stop with a single lane on the northbound approach again low cost lower mobility benefits for those on route one hmm. it would allow for that reestablishment of bike and ped facilities at the intersection If we want to talk about the a signal at this location, it offers improved mobility and the potential for improved pedestrian access throughout the intersection. The opportunity to put in uh, crosswalks at the intersection to tie Union Street um, to the other side of Route 1. It's less expensive than a roundabout, but it's still one of the more expensive alternatives. It's the second most expensive. Just because of it being a signal and motorist behaviors, we would anticipate a slight 
um, decrease in safety at the intersection, but they tended to be minor crashes uh, that were property damage only. We saw signalizing this intersection with the consolidation of the northbound through and right turn lanes and implementing a southbound left turn lane would give us that shoulder for the bike ped element. And signalizing the intersection, as I said, is the second most expensive alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The roundabout gives you the greatest mobility and safety benefits. You move the greatest number of vehicles through most efficiently. Nice. And it also does uh, provide the greatest uh, reduction in crashes. It has substantially greater cost. It would require rebuilding everything at that intersection. So it would be a substantial undertaking. It does require uh, substantial right-of-way acquisition. We do feel that's one of the buildings at that intersection and maybe some of the vegetation, some of the trees would likely need to be removed. And the cost at this location would likely exceed any of the benefits that we would see from either mobility or safety benefits. Interesting. Questions. So questions. From main DOT's perspective, our preferred alternative based <laughs> on the information that's provided would be the signalized intersection. Right. We feel right. it gives us the greatest return with the least uh, negative benefits, only minimal safety impacts, but substantial improvements for all three legs right. of the roadway uh, to be able to uh, improve traffic flow. And it also does provide uh, improved connectivity and safety for bikes and pets through the area. Um, questions before, yeah, have. before we get into questions, I want to go back to, because there's just a lot of data here, a lot of information, but um, you mentioned the report. Does the report it, it have a lot more data in it than you just presented in terms of a, a traffic, you know, studies, numbers, uh, and the kind of backup for some of the I, statistics? I tried to pare it down so you had the most relevant salient points, but there is more data in there that I did not include. I don't know if that's a good answer for you or a bad answer. <laughs> well, for no, you. I'm just trying to, before you, we want to ask I mean, a lot of questions, because there's, there's a lot of, of data, but I, I didn't know what was in this forthcoming report uh, from MDOT, uh, because a lot of my questions are, well, the technical questions regarding, you know, what, what time of year the, the data was t taken in terms of backups and that kind of thing is very important, obviously, to us um, for the various options. Uh, you know, uh, traffic-like configurations and time, uh, 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 the time, um, the timing of lights, uh, it, that makes a huge difference. And, you know, you, you know all this, and that's the questions that, that uh, they're, they're highly technical, but they matter significantly because one of the major effects that occurs here in Camden, though those live here, is a couple of things. One is um, the amoeba effect. And what I, what I call, I know when stuff is backing up and going southbound, and where, where do we and others go? We go through neighborhoods to make take shortcuts. And we get, I get a lot of comments from a lot of people that said, in the summer, the traffic through my small, they consider, you know, neighborhood increases dramatically. Um, so that would be really cautious to evaluate the options from that perspective. The other one that surprised me a little bit was um, safety-wise, we mentioned 22 crashes in nine years. That's three and a half crashes a year. Honestly, that's nothing. That's, that's, that's minor. That's usually minor. Route 1 North has had the same number of accidents per year on average for the for 15 years. I, was, I would have expected more because I think it's a very awkward intersection. And people, I think most out-of-state people almost hit me every time I'm coming up Union Street. But I think anybody who's driven through the intersection more than a few times knows 
how many close calls there are right. as well. And, and the last thing, just and none the, of that gets recorded. And, and don't open up to board discussion. But now, what are the next steps from MDOT's perspective in terms of this potential project? So Maine DOT approached the town several years ago with an offer to install a traffic signal at this intersection. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, the, the town was not interested in moving forward with that. But I think more recently there have been some, some changes in um, the awareness of how how much the community would like to improve the bikeability and walkability through this intersection. And there was a, a sense that maybe the town was more willing to, to consider this alternative at this point in time. Mm -hmm. When I had a conversation with leadership in DOT, DOT is willing to move forward with this project, but we do not want to be uh, what's what I'm looking for? <laughs> we, we, we are not looking at this as a mandate right. for the municipality. Uh, understood. We, and, and Audra and, and Dave know me well enough to know we want to be partners in this process sure. with the town. We do truly believe that this would be an improvement in many ways for many different aspects through that intersection. But Maine DOT is awaiting confirmation of support from the leadership in the town. Yeah, got it. What I have what I have been asked for is if you would like to see one of these alternatives implemented, DOT would like to have a formal letter of request from the town to move forward with that alternative as opposed to us making a decision and just moving forward, whether it was something you agreed with or not. Well, clearly, as I said, there's a lot, a lot of data here and a lot of questions. It's probably where it can't all, I don't think they'll be all answered tonight because some of them are very technical. I, so I you know, had I, no intention <laughs> of tonight being I the didn't, end I, point. I didn't think you did, Patrick. I wasn't uh, alleging that you would even try that. But in the meantime, we do have your attention, so we will ask some generic general questions about the options mm -hmm. while we have your, your attention. So, Allison, you have your hand up first. Um, yeah, so this is on the pathways committee we've talked about this a lot and i heard it come up at those pedestrian safety forums and i've heard over the years lots of people saying well if they just did this if they just did this and um in terms of you know the main goal um i think for a lot of these people would be making it possible to walk to stop and go um which is a destination a lot of people need to get to and then mm -hmm cross the road um, or get, you know, have that sidewalk go all the way down to stop and go. Um, would you say that um, having, you know, adding in a crosswalk or a sidewalk there, is that, are any of the, all those things impossible with the current configuration? Do we have to do something different in order to accomplish that? Can, can I sort of, um, before Patrick answers that, yeah. um, one of the sort of the bigger problems that we have is that if you're in a wheelchair or you mobility impairments or whatever the case may be, you can't walk all the way from downtown Camden to like the Rennie's Plaza or yeah, even on either side, right? There's something. Yeah, else. because of the steps and the tree oh, on right, one right. side and on the other side, it just. Thanks. It's not a real sidewalk. It's just Correct. space that's been claimed and paved, but there's so many utility poles in the way that it, it doesn't provide enough space. So, right. you know, this this sort of um, renewed focus on that intersection really came from, you know, us working with Patrick and his colleagues to really try to figure out a solution with that intersection. And we were looking at it configured as it is now, and there just isn't. Right there just isn't a way to do it if we were to keep it exactly as it is now. So that's why, that's one of the reasons why they sort of revisited, um, you know, old 
um, plans or old studies sure. and updated it to try to figure sure. out what are what are alternatives to how it's configured now and what are the benefits and drawbacks of well, each? That's, I mean, that's, that feeds to the core of the study because if you did consider a traffic signalization of any kind and you could consider pedestrian crossing, you're going to have longer wait times at a traffic light for a person to be able to cross. And that, I don't, I don't know if that data, I, I, don't, I didn't see anything where that data has been included in this study. I, I, I'm presuming that- Like, are we trying to make it safer for, I'm not all that worried about how safe it is for vehicles right now. Like, what was, what's our main goal? Is it to make it safer for pedestrians? Is it to make it safer for vehicles? I think that's what we have to kind of- Well, and that's on. why Patrick is the one presenting, because he's the multimodal program coordinator. Right. So he, right. yeah, he can answer a lot of those questions about the pedestrian and cyclist- Sophie, go ahead. Facilities and safety. So. So piggybacking on, on what you're just saying, Alison, uh, it strikes me that different solutions uh, tend to benefit, I mean, th there, there's, there's more benefits from moving the traffic faster on Route 1 than there are benefits to pedestrian safety um, in terms of cost-benefit analysis as in what you presented us. Like the, 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 the goal is really to move traffic faster on Route 1. Correct. Not faster, well, more efficiently. Mm -hmm. But so to, to reduce the amount of wait time. That, right, that, but that at the has. cost of of increasing the wait time on Union Street or pedestrian and bike safety. I, uh, pretty much. Mm, pretty I don't much. Think so, because some of the alternatives that are presented. Ultimately, the biggest thing that's a barrier right now for, for pedestrian access is that dedicated right turn lane on the northbound leg to, sure. for people to turn onto Union Street. There's not enough space between the curb line and the stop and go to have one lane going southbound, one through lane going northbound, and then that one dedicated right turn lane. Uh, some of that space would be utilized by a sidewalk and or a, a bike lane. But, but I think, I mean, to my, the point I'm trying to make is we need to decide what is the priority number one that we want to achieve, or as Alison was saying, what is our goal with this intersection? Is it to move traffic faster on Route 1? Is it to increase bikeability, walkability, safety? Is it to slow down traffic? I mean, there is virtue in slowing down traffic, especially in a resort town with a lot of people walking around. Increasing speed of traffic is not necessarily something we want to do. So. The point I'm trying to make is who makes that decision? How do, you, do we prioritize the goal we want to achieve by redesigning this intersection? And is it a, is it a joint discussion with M oh. M Main DOT? Is it, is it a, a workshop at the select board? How do we make that decision? I mean, he's the pedestrian safety person, so he has been pretty, he usually yeah, and, does advocate for that. And I would say that when we, you know, like, like I was saying before, when we originally approached this, it was from a bicycle pedestrian right. safety right. perspective. Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that wasn't picked up in this, but I think if you go into the data a little bit more and maybe if you had sort of a traffic engineer who, you know, did this kind of explaining some of it, there's also a lot of weird motorist behavior at that intersection yeah, yeah, where people I'm are sort of punching out. And that makes it difficult if you want to create a crosswalk for people to go from one side of the road to the other to do it safely because, you know, people who are stopped and waiting right. are always looking for that opportunity when people aren't coming in and out of Union Street. So I think I, they're trying, you know, this would, Patrick didn't necessarily talk, say, you know, speak to it when he was talking about the counts and, and who moves more efficiently, but I think that's an important part of all this is the, the behavior and allowing pedestrians, right. pedestrians and cyclists to be able to cross without, right. Right. you know, the, right. that right. sort of behavior right. you get from the way it's configured now. No, I, I completely get it. I, 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 100% happy to redesign this thing and this intersection. I think so. It's an awful intersection for for plenty of reasons that that were highlighted. But my concern is that, I mean, I look at 
traffic lights and there's like I, Patrick, I have such a long laundry list of things that I dislike about, <laughs> about traffic lights that I won't bore you. I mean, my preference has always been roundabouts. I come from, you know, I'm European. In Europe, we favor roundabouts as everywhere as much as we can for a host of reasons. And um, I think I, I want to dig into the data, but I also want to understand the process on how we're going to make that decision. Right. I think... I agree with, with Audra and, and Allison both. I think this conversation, the genesis of this conversation really came about through the pedestrian safety forums and our conversations about how to make it safer to get around town. That connected, that connectivity out to, to Hannaford, the connectivity mm -hmm. to, um, to, yeah. to stop and go, the, the connectivity from one side of Route 1 to the other side. You know, that's really important to me. And the way the intersection is currently laid out with with the stop sign where it is and the way traffic flows, there is no good place on any leg of that intersection for a pedestrian to cross mm -hmm. any of those roads. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the safest place we could identify is is just north of the intersection where the existing crosswalk at, at Free Street. When you go south it, it's still pretty scraggly where the crossing is. That's not a great crossing it's either. Right so one right before it too, like right. so to you know to do some type of improvement here that would give pedestrians access to all four corners of that intersection would be huge for improving your connectivity. Yep. Yeah. And so part of that I think is is eliminating that dedicated right turn lane in order to get that yep. space. Yep. It, it, Patrick, is a incremental approach uh, potentially beneficial? My first thought is um, put the stop sign on Union Street, uh, spin the flashing beacon, uh, and you have a significant intersection improvement there for virtually no cost. It does uh, allow you to eliminate the right turn lane on the northbound. Um, see how that works. If it doesn't do the purpose that we it would like or intend, you know, prioritized, um, then then look at signals. It's an option. I think I think that's a decision that. If, if that's the way the board would like to proceed, that's an alternative mm -hmm. that's, that's put forward here. Once again, for each of these, there are advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, I, I have to agree with you, it's easily the cheapest solution. One of the questions that I have as the non-engineer is, and I don't live in town, how much of the traffic that's on Union Street that we experience right now is derived from the fact that it has the current traffic flow that it does? How many people who live in the Camden area yep. Yep. heading south on Route 1 make that left onto Union Street because they know but they have yeah. five times a day. They have a free turn, yep. and you know how to get from Union Street to wherever you're going. Well, it goes further than that, Patrick, because we put the other it goes the other way too. We we we, we, we reroute ourselves to Union Street to take a right on right. Route One, so you don't have to well, stop. Exactly. You didn't get me. A, you didn't give me a chance to get that. Sorry. <laughs> but those poor people who are the tourists. Yep. who are the, the economic lifeblood of our community are now stuck at that stop sign heading northbound on Route 1. And one of the concerns, and this goes back to one of the things Audra said, think about driver behavior 
when people get frustrated about having to wait. Yep. Yep. That's when people start making bad decisions and choices that put pedestrians, bicyclists, other drivers at risk. Yep. Yep. Yeah, but we shouldn't design for, for, I mean, we have to stop designing for cars. That's, that's basically, you know, well, yeah, but we, also, we, we have to take them into account, but they, well, can no, but they cannot be like the number one priority. We have to shift the paradigm here because yeah, it's, it's... To a point, to a point. Yeah, we, to a point, we but a, we cannot we accommodate... Have, we have now in the summer a, a better part of a mile back up on Route 1 South for every, every day and trying to get through. And my biggest concern would be also the fact that we, if we start causing a backup at, at Union Street for some reason, it's going to back up all the way through Camden, and then your amoeba situation is going to get 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. So you need a bypass. Uh, well, well, hold on, won't they? Oh, why would it back up all the way on Union Street? Because won't people choose? No, uh, I don't know. But uh, Stockton Springs. But I, I think there are, there, there are, right. this is a lot of data in a short time. And Patrick, you know that. You uh, gave me 15 minutes. I did the best I could. You did a phenomenal <laughs> job. You did a phenomenal yes. job. He, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with the presentation. It's, it's got to do with all the work that's been done. It's a lot, a lot more than I have anticipated and, and saw a lot of good data in there. And I want to absorb it and, and try to come me five hours to break the report down to give you that presentation. Five hours, wow. But we need, we, obviously, thanks for saying the report. That's imperative. I think we have to have that. But then we have to figure out to Sophie's point how we noodle, how we work that to discuss the alternatives, everything from a, a, a sequential approach, as Tom's suggesting, right. to something more dramatic. And what I recommend is I, I agree that I think this is my personal opinion. I'm not trying to sway anybody. Right. I think the determination of whether or not you want to add pedestrian facilities at this intersection is the first question to ask yourself and answer. Yep. If you answer yes, that eliminates some of the alternatives. Yep. If you say no, then you have a different set of alternatives to choose from. Right. And then you need to look at, quite honestly, tear the presentation apart and look at the pages side by side. Exactly. And compare the numbers yep. that you see. Yep, I agree. Stephanie, you have any comments? No, I really need to look at. Um, I'm, the, I'm in the same place you I need to, I need to side by side too. There's just too much information to absorb. It's wonderful. Much more than I expected, by the way. I, I really think it was quite well done. I, and from that, questions will evolve. If I, what I can do tonight is email Audra the report yep. and a PDF of the PowerPoint so you yep. could get digital copies. Yep. And since I already have them printed, I'll drop the printed copies in the mail tomorrow. Perfect. If I mail it tomorrow, maybe you'll have it by Friday. Probably. I've given up trying to predict the U.S. Yeah, post office. I, I, I agree. I agree. But that would be great. That's it's, it's a, what a lot of great information to chew on. It really is. And we'll have, we'll have to figure out amongst us boys and girls how we funnel it to a, to a, to a, to a focal point so we can decide good and bad and ugly. Yeah, and I mean... In, wants to say something? Yeah. Patrick, you didn't mention... So, Patrick, you didn't mention the other option that initially that I think Dave Allen suggested or was willing to offer up, and that was a, taking that the best case scenario a step below the roundabout, which was a signalized signalization of that intersection in a temporary oh. way. Oh. So that, and then an evaluation of it after it was in place yeah. for a while. Yeah. I think that was yeah. really something we had discussed that really didn't come up in this. I, I don't mean, I, maybe you left it out on purpose, but. Um, <laughs> did, Dave. I, sorry, you aren't going to get away with it. I wanted to talk about. You're not going to get away with it. You, so we, <laughs> you, that was one of the things we had talked about because, you know, then there's like, it's a, at least a trial type of basis. It takes the best case scenario. It signalizes it. I know it was a little bit more expensive for you to do it that way, but that would give everybody a, 
the opportunity to kind of change their mind, I think, if they found that basically, uh, the it's, data it's, was... It's basically experimental. It was an experiment. So I just want to throw that out there. Yes. I didn't know where that went, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Dave, yeah. thank we you. We explored the option of doing a demonstration there, and the challenge we found was how big the intersection is, how big the corners are because of turning traffic. Mm. They don't make temporary equipment that would allow us to do an honest to goodness, you know, demonstration of how this would work. Mm -hmm. We would have to cobble together a, uh, it would probably be like a half installation of a full fledged piece. Mm -hmm. It would require sinking poles in on the corners and then running span wire across the intersection in order to, excuse me, to get the lights positioned correctly over the lanes that they're, they're guiding. Yep. Um, just really we, quick. quick yeah, go ahead, we should explore it. Um, so is there, in terms of proceeding with digesting, this information, it seemed like a big factor is whether or not we would be interested in the pedestrian crossing improvements and the sidewalk stuff. Does it, do we need to, the way you outlined those options, kind of going back to what Bob's question was, um, if you add in the estimated wait times and pros and cons of each option and, and say, okay, this is what we know it would be if we were to do the crosswalks, I kind of, have a sense that the majority of us aren't interested in doing this if we don't make pedestrian safety improvements, that the idea would be to do it with that. I don't want to make any decisions about anything. Tom. I'm not ready to make any statements about anything. I'm just, this is the first time I've been exposed to this ever in the town of Camden, and I want to think about it and play with it and look at the report, so I, I, I'm not committing to anything. Okay, but if we were to say, if we're, then maybe do we need to separate it out by these are the criteria or these are the pros and cons in a, mm -hmm. in, under this scenario, depending yep. on the goals, yep. and if the goal is yep. pedestrian connectivity, then you exactly. have to look at it. Exactly, exactly, um, yep. Because that's an, I mean. Yep. I agree, I agree. I was not, once again, I'm not the engineer. I wasn't <laughs> there for the calculations. I do not anticipate that the adding of crosswalks would substantially change wait times or, or the overall traffic flow through this intersection. Mm -hmm. right, it's not based New York on City. Timing. It's like and, but I do see a dramatic increase in the safety for pedestrians going mm -hmm. through this intersection. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, yeah. one of the other elements that I didn't mention is um, we also may have the option of incorporating intelligent signalization at this intersection. It's responsive, it's dynamic. So we're putting that in at more and more locations. Like with Cassidy. What I mean by it being dynamic and responsive, I'm probably not the only one who's here tonight who hates sitting at a red light when you don't see any cars anywhere else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. These, this intelligent transportation system actually evaluates traffic flows and modifies the signalization timing to maximize uh, the efficiency of vehicle movements through the intersection. Right. So you're not sitting there uh, at a red light when nobody's coming through the intersection the right. other ways you'd end up getting a green signal. That's so traffic. That, that's, the Wiscas, that's the Wiscasset model. I believe so, yes. Is. Okay, good. Um, boy, lots to, lots to chew on, Patrick. Great job. Um, so here's what I can put on the table. I heard somebody mention it earlier. I realize that this is a lot of information 
And quite honestly, I had to see it and look at it and turn pages yep. for me to understand it. I really don't nothing against you. I don't expect anybody to have really fully comprehended what I was saying right. until you have a chance to read it and look at it deeper. Somebody had mentioned the possibility of a workshop yep, and or a workshop session. You know, I could make myself available. I can see if the region engineer would be available. Unfortunately, the young lady who who generated this report is out on maternity leave, so she's going to be out for a little while longer. I don't know when her return to the office is. Okay. So I can't offer her up for those specific questions. Okay. But we could plan a working session if you are interested to delve into this a little bit deeper. Yeah, that's a, that sounds good, Patrick. But I mean, in the, between now and that point, we, we've got to get some of our act, act together in terms of objectives and that kind of, we may have to have one just a moment. Well, we have to work on that. But first and foremost, we hope to get this week, latest Monday, the reports and information so we can start chewing on it. Then, we have to, then, we'll, then we'll have to have, we have a, a, a responsibility to, uh, to f uh, focus and fill filter whatever information we may want to be asking so it doesn't become a, you know, a, a one size fits all kind of meeting. So one of the things I haven't mentioned, and to be honest, I haven't necessarily been authorized to say it, <laughs> but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, Maine DOT is look at, would be looking at doing these improvements with no local cost share. Okay. Now, if you want to, to contribute to the project, we're willing to let you. Of course. <laughs> but I do not anticipate that that would be a requirement. Okay, we'll, we'll let you know on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. We're going to have to uh, move on, but this has been great. Um, uh, it Thank was a you. lot of information. Thank you. Thank you. This is not the, obviously the last time we'll be talking. Thank you, sir. Good. Thank you, and we'll look forward to Glad seeing to the help. reports. Thank you very Thank you. much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too. Have a wonderful evening yourself. Now that we took up all of his evening. Bye, Patrick. Um, bye, all. Bye, all. Um, Let's we'll go on to our last agenda item, which is select board reports. And I'll start with Stephanie. Do you have anything you'd like to report, Stephanie? Are we going to do the, the carry over? Oh, yeah, sorry, carry yeah, Audrey, you didn't slap me around about the carry forward. Sorry, forwards. I didn't. Okay, I was let's start off. Thank you, thank you. But the carry forward, Audrey, maybe a little brief intro to remind us and, and to, uh, if there are questions of uh, new members, what the carry forward thing is that we do every year, what it is. Yep, so at the, um, at the end of each financial year, so around you know, this time we have a good idea of, um, you know, where the the budget from FY22 is is sitting and, you know, what um, line items still have funds available in them and whether or not that's going to be useful for the upcoming year. Um, if that money isn't carried forward uh, and the select board makes the decision on what gets carried forward and what doesn't, it lapses into the surplus or what we call the unassigned fund balance. Mm -hmm. So the carry forwards really just give, um, you know, department heads and the select board an opportunity to, um, you know, look at what we have left and if there's a, a project that we weren't able to expend all the funds on um, for that financial year we can carry forward into the next financial year. Mm -hmm. uh, we do it very commonly with um, you know, the capital improvement projects because often those span a number of years, uh, but it can also be with you know, more operational items. Um, you know, it, it could be um, you know, that we know that we're going to be spending a lot more money in the upcoming year on um, like a, the records preservation project that's Mm -hmm. You know, an, an example of something where we might not have been able to spend down that money in FY22, but we have a plan for FY23 for how we're going to use it. So that's the, the purpose of the carry forwards. Um, we've traditionally carried forward quite a bit of money in the departments, and one of the things that we're trying to do instead of carrying forward these line items into the operational budget 
if there's an appropriate reserve account that we can carry them forward into and it makes sense to do so, we'll do, we'll do that instead or we'll recommend to do that instead. Yeah, I think the, the, the difference there, so you all know, it, it is, is rather than carrying the, the specific amount of money forward in that budget account, it's put in a, a bucket of reserve. So if you want to use it for that department during the year, you take it out of that reserve total bucket for its use. This is most often done when you when you've had carry forwards every year of the same amount, which means you're not using it. So if you're not using it, why why put the tag on it as a as a as a budget item and just put it in the reserve? Or some things, you know, there's a lot of money that we allow to lapse into surplus because that's a more appropriate place for it. But right. these are the areas where um, you know the department heads have identified that it's. Um, appropriate to carry it forward into FY23. Right. And, and, and I would point out that most of the carry forwards, as you can see, the bulk of the money is in capital projects. Uh, that's where it is, what, 1.2 million total of, uh, I think, carry forward uh, that needs to be considered. But most of that money is, is, in, the, is in capital projects that are listed here. I'm trying to get to it, but like fingering through a thousand. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I'm going to get there in about three years. I know. Jeez, Roger, could you explain just so I fully understand? Um, sure. So, I'm looking, for instance, at uh, out uh, culture and recreation. I'm just going to pick any mm -hmm. summer rec program. Um, we have the option of carrying forward thirteen thousand one hundred and ninety dollars from fiscal year twenty two to twenty three and if we choose not to, that would go into a different uh, fund for the town that 's more f for broader use yes, yeah, so it would just lapse into the surplus okay or the and the surplus is still available uh, for you or other no oh, so the, the no tricky part with it lapsing into surplus is once it's there it can only be used by a vote of town meeting and that's usually done during the budget process okay yeah thank you but to your point tom you could take the thirteen thousand dollars and for that department and put it into the reserve it's kind of like a contingency account and then you could use it um if if it were needed uh, in the following year you could do that for another purpose other than parks and rec well, no, it's, it would be reserved in the Parks and Rec Okay, department. in Parks and Rec, okay. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about, too. What's, there's a rule about transferring so, between only 10, was it 10% of the? Yeah, across different budget lines. So, yeah. So, we it, can't take, like, leftover public works money and give it to Steve Pixley. Right, and, yeah, because I guess. Only 10%, we could. 10 that's, no, that's a good point. Because the budget is approved by voters for these different right. items, you, we have to stick to as close the category that, that they're meant approved in any for. Kind of a, no, I know. I, you um, just gave a good just opportunity to explain it. That's a good point. Yeah. Do we have an idea? Sorry. Do we have an idea of the aging of those carry forwards? You mean for each individual one, like how? Yeah, so how, how, long, long, how so long we've been carrying We've been carrying them. them. I would say that the one that kind of jumps out at me, the rest of, you know, the ones that are um, for like the capital improvement projects, um, some of them, you know, it's been several years now. And, you know, we're trying to address that by, um, you know, sort of budgeting differently for our capital improvements. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we talked about um, instead of, you know, CIPs that we know that are going to span multiple financial years, creating a reserve account for those instead of automatically creating a CIP for them. CIP um, is a capital improvement project. Yeah, sorry for using acronyms. Um, so I think, you know, but that's more of a going forward thing so that we aren't carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars forward yeah. um, year in and year out. For the, I guess for the others that are on the list here, well, there was, um, there was Go ahead, Roger. Sorry, the, the more departmental ones, the ones that aren't um, capital in nature, yep. I would say that there's only a couple that jump out as mm -hmm. ones that um, have been carried forward longer than just this financial year. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's one in the general government. It's the marketing mm -hmm. budget. That's, that's definitely sort of accumulated to a pretty large sum and it's been carried forward for a 
few different financial years, and I'd have to go look back to see mm -hmm. which ones. But What's um, the definition of marketing in this context? Brochures, Website redesign and stuff. Well, I see that that's what's proposed for. That's that's no. how that's the reason proposed for carrying it forward. But is marketing bigger than just that's like a budget line in our. Yeah, so I, I think when it was created. They used to like run ads all over the place. Well, that's to promote Camden and get them on, get us that's on those kind lists, of what it was. I didn't care for, yeah, for at the time. Too. What? There's newsletters too. Well, the newsletters were. Marketing, that's marketing. So it was just like the basic town I newsletter, guess, which I really think we should get back in the habit of doing. Agreed. But, just, but there was actual marketing that was going on that it was like yeah. how to get, you know, top 10 places to. Go to the or, beach or retire. Are, we are, paid to be on a lot of those things. Just yes. to point out, there are three mega buckets here. The last bucket is probably the easiest one, which is a, a small shred. The third one, that is a recommendation to your point, Tom, about transferring a total of three hundred and no, two hundred and eighty-two, whatever the number, a thousand dollars, transferring it from uh, carry forward to reserves. That's the third spreadsheet. Where's oh, the third? What's the, the third, third spreadsheet? The last spreadsheet. In oh, the, the transfer to reserves, yeah. yes. So that amount, that chunk of monies, which is over a quarter million dollars, is being recommended to be transferred. For example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ICMA uh, MPERS amount, $2,000 transferred to public safety reserve. So it's being put in the reserve for that department, so it could be used for that or something else later. But that, to that, that, that is one action we, we need to consider. The other two are, are, are actual carry forwards. One is wastewater, which is wastewater commissioners. We should be looking at that. But um, that's $228,000 uh, and no recommendation for any transfers there. And then the big, the first one, the biggie, $1.377 million. That one is also as it currently stands, doesn't have any recommendations, except Audra is maybe, I'm hearing, recommending the 34,874 marketing in the uh, professional, uh, is that professional General services? government. General government, yeah, is it may be one we could possibly transfer it to reserve. Is there any others, Audra? Um, I would say that the, the dams, um, instead of, you know, um, Carrying forward into the operational. This is in wastewater. No, no, no this dams. is in the in um, the first spreadsheet. First spreadsheet. Got it. In culture and recreation. Oh, I see. We have um, reserve accounts for that purpose as well. So that I, that could be transferred to the reserve account for the d dams maintenance. Mm -hmm. So, but I guess my my, my more. Uh, so I'm I'm not opposed to carrying forward, in in as a general accounting principle. My question is, I would like to see plans to actually spend down those carry forwards because these are things that need to happen, right? Mm -hmm. All of them oh, necessarily. I mean, how much more marketing do we need to do? I don't know. Well, if that account has been languishing at thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars for two so, years, so let's I'll, get. I'll bother. But so, so that's why. I'm, okay, so I agree with you. I don't understand which ones I need to put in reserve. That's the problem. And which ones, you know, like the I and I study, I know we're going to finish it. Well, right? I would say so, so I'd say you can assume everything on these spreadsheets that they're they're recommending unless there's something saying transfer to reserve, they're recommending you just carry it forward into that same line so item. That, that's the way I'm reading. I'm sure yeah. you... The department had saying that they need it to do something else. Yes. Yeah. That didn't get finished yeah. and yeah. And, or, or they're needing, you know, they um, recognize now with what they have budgeted that it would be helpful to have the, those additional funds to cover something like with the, um, you know, the contract that we have with the YMCA for the right. summer rec program. Right. 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 That, that I understand. Okay. So the 1.377 million and change, the only item you could possibly debate is 34,000. It's kind of chump change in the total. Yeah, and I mean, and it's, it's not even you could you could just carry it forward into that. Um, operational line if you want. You don't have to yeah. go with the recommendation to put it in a reserve. It, um, okay. Or like, reserve, would you put it in? Just the general economic development reserve. To, to access a reserve, the department head has to come to the select board? Yes. Okay. Yep. When it's not there. Yep. yep. Um, so, the economic development reserve, I guess I don't know about that one. <laughs> there are just so, there's so many. Oh, the, the list of reserves would make your head spin. Yeah, there's there a, a lot. communications reserve. Uh, 
I can get those newsletters we back. Can, we can make or like, one. <laughs> I, I guess you know, the, the to get back to substance, um, we have a couple of choices. We can first take the first spreadsheet <laughs> of the one with the one point the recommended from most of the monies is in debt capital contingency, and that is one point two uh, two three. Is that number? Yeah, yeah, one point two uh, one and a quarter million dollars. That's that's projects. Um, yeah. And, and I doubt we're going to be moving any of those around. So the, the delta between that and 1.377 is $140,000, which is this miscellaneous stuff. So, you know, you, you're really not playing with a lot here. And no. my recommendation was just to stick with the 1.377 and carry forward. I I mean, I just don't think it was, we, you know, unless, unless we, Audra felt strongly about any account, but I'm not hearing that. No, I, I think it'd probably make it more complicated at this so, point, too. so. So I would look to motion to, at least the first motion, to accept the total general fund carryover of 1,377,191. So moved. I'm just curious, 1,377, what is the second oh, that, for a purpose of discussion? Uh, second for purpose. You have to keep jumping ahead. I'm going to discipline you again. No, what are your questions? Again. <laughs> I'm unruly. Oh, my finish. word. Yes, yes, I, I, we, I, we second I, I did, yeah. Yep, sir. Thank you. One point three million dollars. What is the proportion of our annual town budget? Uh, you know what I mean? Mm, approximately uh, nine point so, seven. I was going to say almost ten percent. Nine point seven. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's not uncomfortable. Good job, guys. No, but no, no, it's, I mean, it's, but it's in the budget. No, no, I know yeah. it's in the budget, no. but it means that there's 10% of money that we're not acting no, no, on. No, I kind of disagree with you because if you, if one, point, one and a quarter million of that amount is capital projects that haven't been finished. So, like the seawall, for instance, there's, that's not enough money so we'll be to rebuild the seawall. Okay. So, no way. But we want to keep it there for when we rebuild the seawall. Right. Okay. Right. Or, or I guess, like, you know, the. The pumper yeah. truck, it's a, you know, expensive piece of equipment that we've already ordered. Um, <laughs> we haven't paid for it because okay. we haven't received, we haven't it, received yet. it yet. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess your point, yeah. really, what's your point, Sophie, the amount we're looking at is more, what is the total? It's uh, uh, $70,710. Right, right, I get it. General government. And I and it's a, it's a good point though, Sophie. And that's it's it something that you know, Jody and I have talked a lot about how the way that we've budgeted in the past. Like um, to give you an example, so the first year that I started in the in the budget that I sort of came here with, and that Bob and Allison came here with as well, it had um, the uh, Route One North sidewalk. Pro, or sorry, Route 1 South is what they call it. Right. Route 1 South sidewalk project was budgeted and it was a CIP for that year as well as the um, the Washington Street sidewalk Route from Matthew. South. Oh, yeah. toward yeah. okay. Yeah. And that's being yeah. done now. Yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, that was when I first started, that was a CIP for five, that year. Five years ago. So for five years, we've had to carry, carry it forward, forward as a CIP. So what Jody and I have talked about is when you have a project like that, where you know that there's going to be multiple years of planning and, right. you know, design and engineering, and then, you know, you, you bid it out and you find out that it's like twice the cost of what you budgeted in FY18 or whenever. A better way to do it and what we're trying to do now is create reserve accounts for these multi-year projects Absolutely. so that we can keep coming back to them and we don't have to carry forward this money year in and year out. So we're trying to be better about that and the only things that we'll put in as a CIP are piece of, uh, pieces of equipment that we can buy that financial year or the project once we actually have everything done and it's ready to go, pulling it out of reserve and putting it into a, a CIP. So a quick color coding of this, for instance, would help like, you know, yes. next, next time we look at them so that we know this is a carry forward, this goes to reserve, this is going to be, this truck hasn't been delivered yet. I think that would just help mm -hmm. with, you know, speed. So I have a motion and second any further discussion. All those in favor? Five zero. Now to the second spreadsheet, which is really wastewater, so make believe we're wastewater commissioners. We have 228,481. Are there any comments on these? No. no. So I need a motion for that to be I'm, carried I'm, forward. I make a motion that we carry forward 220,000, 228,000 dollars for 
$481, sorry, Correct. to the, budget, to the FY23 Correct. budget. So, can I make a quick point with this just for Tom and Stephanie's benefit? Sure. So your role as wastewater commissioners is a little different than your role as select board members. Your, your powers are more similar to that of like a city council. So this, um, the surplus or the unassigned balance for the wastewater fund is separate than the general fund budget. So if you were to let this money lapse into a surplus, you still have the authority to decide how that's spent it's and it different. doesn't need to go back to voters. Right. Because you, budget. the select board, approves the wastewater and the snowball budgets. It doesn't have to go to no, voters. It doesn't go to voters. That's correct. Good it's point. not in a town budget. That's a good point. So one this of the few one. areas we have more power. That's correct. There are wastewater. That's wastewater, yeah. yeah there's three major buckets we discussed. The general fund, which is a whole town. Wastewater, separate, special project, doesn't get voted on. Uh, and Snowball, special project, doesn't get voted on either. So this wastewater thing is, uh, is, is, is we have a lot more flexibility with this one in a sense. But, but should we vote as wastewater, wastewater commissioners? <laughs> well, they have to do that anymore. They changed the charter oh, so that the you charter, don't. charter so we don't yeah. have to. Right. That's right. Uh, Thank you. You're the only one that has to be a wastewater commissioner. Do we still but, get our wastewater commissioner stipend? Yes. Yeah. You get $1,500 as a select board member and $500 as a wastewater commissioner per year. And I accept donations. I'm, I'm, I'm not sorry. I made a motion. You, you, and, and Was it second? second? I didn't hear a second. I didn't hear a second. I'll second. Okay, motion made and second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? 5 0. Thank you. And lastly, now this one is the little, the little one, which is for the amount of 282,675. Now, this one, all of these are being transferred to the respective reserves as note annotated in the spreadsheet. I make a motion that we approve all the transfers to the reserve in the amount of two hundred eighty-two thousand dollars six hundred seventy-five. Correct. Second. Second. Tom, thank you. Further discussion. All those in favor? All five. Thank you very much. And not, that completes that item. Finally, <laughs> <laughs> I missed it three times. Uh, back to select board report. Stephanie, did you want to add anything? A select board report level? Nope. Mr. Tom Hedstrom. No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Bob, I'm, I'm, I can't go next. So, so, Sophie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just uh, a couple things. Uh, the first one is that we, Bob and I, attended a meeting of the investment committee uh, mm -hmm. to look at the status of the trust funds, and uh, it was very informative. And I think we have a very healthy trust fund as it is with good strategy moving forward to keep, you know, to preserve and to protect basically the increase that we've seen over the years. Um, and uh, we don't have to revisit this until the fall. And we do it at least two or three times a year. Two or three times a year, yeah. a year. so we're going to... Depending, maybe more, the market's rather volatile right now, and of course the trust funds aren't yep. where they were six months ago. Uh, nobody's uh, portfolios are there. The yep. general market is down, what, 15 so the yeah, and the forecast is to be I think nineteen percent down. Well, yeah. But the our inv investment firm who manages those invest those portfolios is doing a little bit better than the market right now. So right. that's reassuring. Right. But it's something to keep an eye on. You guys will start getting if you haven't already. Have you gotten the stuff in the mail? I always find it. I found it like kind of strange that as soon as I got elected to the select board, the investment company already knew, and I would get. You know, you get it mailed like this big packet to your house, and I yeah, know, but I've kind of they're kind right of, on top of that. I've uh, kind of admonished them to send it to the town rather than homes. Yeah, but then, I'm still getting mine. No, that's fine. You're welcome to have it. I, I don't. I get mine here. Yeah. But anyway, it's it's just what it is. But yeah, you can, so you, can a, you can review the portfolio and you know see what's going on and what its performance is for the how many trusts is there? Seven, nine. Well, the big issue, though, is that no matter, it, I, and I'm glad that you brought this up, Sophie, and since you're on the trust fund committee now, too, right. what they don't do a good job of is separating out, um, like, it's, we have some of those um, funds that are not no, associated no. with, the, with the, um, the funds that we use for general assistance type things, mm -hmm. and so seeing it all separate well, you want it, you want a lump so that, like fund would you like so to that you can see fund? like these are the yeah the this is we what we've that. used we can do that. um 
We can do that by fund, yeah. By so fund, no, because yeah. the because oh, the yeah. trust funds continue the ones that are supposed to be used to help people. Yeah. Yep, you know, yep, they continue yep, to yep, grow, yep. and we're All only right. allowed to use the interest. But that's the no, we, we have the opposite that. problem. We're spending like way way less than we ever generate in interest. So that's true. there yeah. is a real opportunity to be able to help yep. more people. Um, the stipulation is. The, the biggest fund is the most broadly worded, which is for the poor and unfortunate residents of Camden. Right. Um, it's the Charles Wood Fund. It started in around 1950, right. and so some of the language is a little antiquated. But it does, um, you know, for yeah. the trust fund committee reviews it, and it's just something for, yeah, just for so, you guys to you know, keep in mind. We that can, um, We can break those out by trust we fund. Should. We do it a lot just by, we fund our own general assistance program, yeah. and so we do a lot of like helping people that come in and needing temporary housing or whatever. But there's also we're trying to make an effort also to look for opportunities to fund organizations that are doing you know that's like you know food pantries and and things like that or if somebody's building These, a homeless um, shelter yeah. so that the town's not we're not really all that right we don't have the bandwidth to be handing out hundred dollars here and a hundred dollars there it'd be better to right. kind of well, help an organization to, to Tom and Stephanie's benefit these these funds when I joined the select board we joined the select board in many years ago um, <laughs> The funds were in the order of two, two and a half million. Today, they are June thirtieth. They are at six point one. Six point one. Yeah. But <laughs> at twelve thirty one twenty one, they were at seven million. So the market has hit us a little bit. But the overall, uh, the overall um, performance has been good. And, it, and that's a summary of all of the X number of trusts. The town, they're as small as 20,000, as large as, mm -hmm. as the Woods Fund, which is a multi million. Um, and, but they total, and they're, they're an in perpetuity kind of investments where we allocate to stock versus fixed income versus, you know. But then there's some that are just like the, the mid coast solid waste closure that, fund that, and the things separate, that are that's not. That's 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 separate. That's separate. see all of that separated no, out. But that's, from the, no, separate. but the mid coast, the mid -coast that closure. Separate, but the ones from the, the town, like. Yeah, the different ones we can. can, can I mean, yeah, by fund. By fund, it would be interesting. We're just looking at the general health and the st st strategy right. that the, our investment manager is, is adopting know, and, and making sure. I'm, I, I agree with you. It would be helpful, and we can yeah, we can ask easily. we can ask him to do. I'll actually I'll, I'll ask Mike to do that. I'll take care of that Matt, since yeah. I'm. The um, but I think one of the um, um, I, I think that's you know uh, important to break it down by fund because they did, the magnitude of funds is dramatically different. Because yeah. we're and, trying to have a sense of you know how much should we be. Right. Spending for a year. I mean, it's a little bit em embarrassing how underspent it is. Yep. Sometimes uh, they I don't. Would, I would agree. You don't want to broadcast it out to the world. Hey, there's all this money, but Especially at some don't point, broadcast you know, there are people in Camden that that need help, and well, told, if you're willing to provide income information and to, you know, total total withdrawals. There's a lot of ability to help people. Well, I think last year's total total withdrawals was only about 150, 170 thousand dollars. And that was a, that was a great year because yeah. you know I think the like first year I started it was like twenty three thousand right. dollars. So it, we're making an effort. And, and, and lastly, there is an IPS investment policy statement yeah. that is approved so every so often by the select board. In terms of it specifies how the financial advisor is, is um, evaluated. You know uh, how much they are allowed to charge us for fees, and also, um, uh, you know, also what the investment strategy is because we don't allow unlimited, uh, you know, investment in equities because it can be volatile. And we spent that's all in, in an IPS. If you're interested, we can get you a copy of it. Yeah. Some people might not think the town should be heavily invested in Dunkin' Donuts, right? Seeing that we try didn't want them to be here, but right. but we are. Um, I, I still can't find that. We, anyway, we're mostly in fun, we're in just like you look at you yeah. look at the stuff we're invested in. It's like oh, oh, interesting. That's like anyway, all um, the people of Camden rally. One battle at a time. No, I'm going to stop here. One battle at a time. <laughs> exactly. Um, nope. I think I've already used up enough time. But you, thank you, you for the really? opportunity. You can save it for reserve for next time. Yeah. yeah, I have I to feel the same. I reserve I, the remainder of my time for some well, future occasion. Something, actually, uh, something else. I'm sorry. Uh, we had the kickoff call with Audra and uh, and Forrest Bell. With oh. Forrest Bell and Maggie. I think that's important. That was my number two. So we're we're finalizing the contract. I think this week, Audra, because mm -hmm. she, I was remiss. I need to give her one last piece of information. The consultant. The river consultant and. River um, consultant. Yeah, river consultant. That was nice how you. Can 
he's a damn consultant and you're are, right. Are you, uh, are you unruly? No, I, no, am, I am. I'm, <laughs> learning from from you. I'm learning from you. <laughs> Keep, no, go ahead. Keep, um, anyway, so, so, and they're going to submit a revised work plan. Uh, because to take into account the, the date we're going to be starting at, but I think we had a really good conversation um, and we're going to continue the conversation. We have different touch points with them along the course of their engagement with us. Um, and uh, we're going to also, Alison has volunteered to give them a lot of information that mm. she's had. So it's started. Sounds great. Now I'm really done. Really? Okay, good. Um, only a minor thing, I'm just a reminder, we have a workshop on Thursday, 1 o'clock, and I propose that be in order of about an hour. Um, there's data you have, a packet you have. Let's hope that'll uh, make the meeting somewhat more efficient, but we'll see. To what topic is that one? The, uh, the um, you would ask, oh, okay. is, is the moratorium on uh, on peers, docs, okay. and folks? Okay, yep. Yep. That's on Thursday at 1. I've got one thing, so I jumped right past you. Okay. I'm not used to you being here. What's that? I already asked them. Oh, you did. I'm oh, sorry. Or actually, no, I have two things. Um, so just to give everyone a heads up, I met with um, down uh, a downtown property owner. They own a few buildings who received um, the letters about their license being revoked, mm -hmm. and Mark. they parking, but they they also. Um, address the fact that one of the licenses covers uh, their ability to have decks off the back of their buildings so they can access them. Mm -hmm. So I said that what, what we could do was just write up a new license agreement that would sort of protect yep. their ability to have those, um, or to keep those decks there. Um, so once you know we've got that drafted, um, I, I can bring that to the select board to have a look at it. I, we're going to go back and forth with the property owners a little bit on that, and there's a couple of them. So um, we're going to be working on that pretty soon. Um, another thing, I'm going to. Does everybody know what we're talking about? Do you, Probably do you guys not. know? Because this was not. Oh, uh, this isn't right. obvious to most people that mm -hmm. that the area of the public yeah, landing. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. That's. Um, most people that kind of there's like a little private parking area on the public landing and then when you go down the walkway to the left it's like grassy and there's like the landscaping is a little nicer than the rest of it and so that was an agreement mm -hmm. back started like 1990s even before that where yeah. I think it was at a time when the public landing wasn't as popular that those building owners um, had an agreement with the town where they would do the landscaping there and in return they got to have, I think it was six, um, split up between them, six private parking spaces. Um, and so, what was it, a few months ago? Um, um, it was actually about three and a half months ago. Okay. A few. Um, I don't know, that's not a few to me. It was, yeah. it was a long time ago, but anyway, go ahead. Okay, that was that's, that's basically it. it. We vote, we talked about um, right about ending those agreements so that that space could be reclaimed as um, I don't, there's no plan for it yet, but the the agreements require a 90 day notice. Um, so we voted at that point to end correct. the That's end the agreement so that we could at least have it on the table to to use that space for mm -hmm. public space um, but it's interesting because a lot of people really don't know that it's they don't that it is public space um, there so mm -hmm. with that um, I got oh, one more one thing. more I forgot your second one <laughs> so for the priorities workshop I'm putting together a packet of information to send out to everyone and that'll include you know sort of the list of current projects yep. um, you know the the capital plan as well as the debt schedule um, and also you know all the um, you know past years priority setting and what what came out of that and sort of Great. Um, grouping everything by the uh, priorities and goals identified by the select board over the past few years and the projects that have been uh, progressed in service of those goals. So you just have all that background information. That's great. Thanks, Audra. That'll help a lot. Yeah. That's an August something. I forget. Yeah, I, I figured though there's a lot of information. So giving, you know, doing that and giving it out to everyone ahead of time so that if anybody has any questions. And we set we that time. date without your involvement. So August we, 2nd, right? I, you would ask. Um, uh, just in case there's a problem with it, uh, let no, us know. No, that's fine. Okay. That works. You, 
you there. Right, with that, <laughs> I would request a motion to adjourn. Make a motion we adjourn the select board. Second. Motion made and second. Any discussion? Like you want to continue? Uh, all those in favor? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. Appreciate it.